to share it with colleagues afterwards who, who maybe weren't available to join. We will also make all of these slides available today. Um, we do have a pretty large group joining. And so as part of that, um, we'll ask that you share reflections and questions in the chat. Um, after each presentation today, we'll have some dedicated time for, for Q&A. Um, but encourage the robust conversation that we saw yesterday and, and sharing of resources in the chat. Um, the other thing is we will be continuing to use um, Mural for those of you who were here yesterday. Um, you're familiar with that, but I'll drop the link into the chat for ease of reference. And then I'll just do a quick overview um, to show what this looks like. So for those who maybe are not as familiar with Mural, let me get to the right tab. Mural is in essence a virtual whiteboard, um, trying to give us that opportunity to engage as if we were all in a room doing fabulous brainstorming together, but instead we're going to do fabulous brainstorming virtually. And so when you are in Mural, we have pre-populated sticky notes, and if you want, you just click on it and start typing. And it'll adjust to allow you to fit however much text you want. Um, in addition to that, you'll see you can also kind of respond to other people's ideas and build on them by grouping sticky notes. The beauty is they are flexible and editable, editable in that way. You are also welcome if you see an idea and you're like, yes, that's what I was thinking. I really like that to upvote it. Um, and so you just can copy and paste one of these thumbs up icons and move that there. The other piece as we're using Mural is we do have on the side these this outline to make it easier to jump to the sections. Um, so you will see that across this board we have um, first what are some of the barriers that get in the way to addressing PCBs and we've broken those out by a couple of topics. So from monitoring and source identification to funding and scaling solutions to technology. Um, understanding the impact on human and wildlife, regulatory and management tools, as well as other. And so we want to understand both what's getting in the way for these, but also some of the solutions that you're really excited about when it comes to, to all of those. And then we also have a place to capture some um, additional tools and analyses and resources that would be helpful um, as we, we move forward with this potential collaboration. So again, this will be open for a week after today to continue give everybody some time to continue to reflect um, and in prompts may be inspired by the presentations, but it also may be inspired by your day to day work. Um, the goal is to have collective insights here um, to help shape collaborations and opportunities um, to improve the tools for all of us. And so if you have questions on this or on anything related to Zoom technology, please feel free to reach out to Katrina or myself um, in Zoom or tagged with support to make it easy to find us. But with that, I am going to hand it back to Will um, to kick things off for this morning. And I will also drop in the chat the link one more time for ease of access. Great. Thanks, Marielle. Um, I'm Will Hobbs. I'm with Washington State Department of Ecology, one of the co-conspirators on this symposium. Um, Andy, did you want to share the intro slides or do you want me to bring them up? Sorry. Should have organized that beforehand. Are you not seeing them? Did I mess up my screen share? I'm not seeing them, no. Just, um, I think I stole the screen share from you. There you go. It's sharing now. Do you want to go down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. So let's just, um, so we've got a, a full day today. So this is day two. Um, we had a great day yesterday. Um, three great talks uh, from the Puget Sound region of Washington, Spokane River in Washington State also in the Great Lakes region. Um, we have an equally packed day today. So three more talks. Um, Greg Allen's going to lead off with a talk on Chesapeake Bay. John Cargo is going to cover some of the activities in Delaware, the Delaware River. 
and then uh, Natalie Burgo and Dave Dickerson are going to um, talk about New Bedford Harbor. Um, again, we we've, we've only got a short break in there, like yesterday. Um, so you know, hopefully you'll stay with us. Um, and then we're going to provide some time at the end of the day, um, just for some closing remarks and reflections. Um, open it up to speakers and others, and then um, you know we're just going to continue people, I think, to use that mural board that Marielle um, just demonstrated. Um, and we're going to use that, keep it open after the meeting to continue to collect feedback and, and thoughts on, on what we're trying to do here. Um, and so in light of that, do you want to cycle to the next slide? Um, what we are trying to do here is um, this is a bit of an experiment. So um, this is uh, just to sort of review for those who, who weren't able to attend yesterday. Um, thought we'd just spend some time going over the objectives and background of this. So um, this symposium grew out of the, the meeting of two working groups um, dealing with toxics in the regions, um, thinking about you know, the fact that a lot of estuaries and rivers have contaminant problems, and perhaps there's room here for us to start sharing um, some of our experiences and thoughts um, you know, cross-regionally. So, so the whole premise of putting this together is to, to see if, you know, there's utility in sharing information on our programs and projects and best practices, um, which would hopefully lead to improving the effectiveness um, by which we tackle some of these contaminant issues. So the, the, the focus uh, is really on trying to share some practical advice, be it um, from the monitoring perspective or regulatory frameworks, um, cleanup, um, whatever those aspects might be. So one of the first objectives for carrying out this symposium is really just to share some background across these geographies. So today we're, we're dealing with sites uh, solely on the East Coast. Uh, next slide, then Andy. Our, our second objective then is to really seek some feedback from everybody that's attending and tell us whether this was a useful exercise and whether we should think about carrying this forward and perhaps what that might look like if we move forward. Um, so, you know, is, is replicating something like this the most useful use of our time or should we think about doing something else that sort of focuses on discussion groups, existing work groups, um, perhaps in person things at work at uh, conferences or workshops. Um, and, and if we do continue on, um, what, what should we focus on? We've chosen to deal uh, with PCBs for this uh, initial symposium. Um, is, is it useful to focus on an aspect of PCB science or cleanup, or should we shift to something else that's um, perhaps more emerging like um, PFOS, PFAS. Um, so, so those are just kind of an overview um, of the, the main objectives of what we're trying to do with this. Um, next slide. So being, being day two, um, we just thought we'd put up just some initial thoughts of, of some of the common things we heard yesterday. Um, you know, so we had three presentations um, yesterday all representing fairly large, multifaceted, multi-layered programs, which is probably pretty common for large regional um, contaminant programs. Um, we had some pretty different ecosystems that were presented, but yet we, we were seeing some monotonic declines in some of the PCB levels, um, perhaps decreasing and, and perhaps showing decreasing rates of decline. Um, in the case of the, the Great Lakes, we saw um, some remediation hotspots that um, could be relatively straightforward to clean up. At least that's that's the impression that was given. Is there's a lot more that goes into that. We know um, we were seeing, I think, some um, presentations on monitoring and source identification um, that that really were showing some some nice long term trends. So, you know, some of the things. Uh, that they had in common were consistent methods and matrices through time and and you know those allow you to to sort of document changes over time and so 
um, we did have some nice presentations on, on uh, long-term data sets. Next slide. And then, you know, with removal of, of hotspots comes the sort of residual uh, lower PCB levels and, and so what's left and, and you know, that's a, that's a very difficult thing to deal with. And so you have perhaps possibly have ongoing impairments. And then we have challenges uh, among different requirements from different regulatory bodies and, and um, frameworks as well. And, and as a, a big positive, I think we, we saw a lot of um, evidence of agreements and external collaborations that are necessary, along with multiple funding opportunities to sort of uh, pull all of these things together. So, you know, these are, these are just some initial thoughts. These are not um, to summarize everything that we know. Um, and, you know, so just some thoughts from day one. I'm really looking forward to hearing from the three regions from the East Coast. Um, so we can have a, a more holistic sort of shared experience here with, with PCBs. Um, I think that's about it. That's all about, about all I wanted to cover for the intro remarks. Um, we're not quite at 9.15. I, I feel like we should wait until 9.15, Greg, in case somebody wants to jump on right on the mark. Um, so maybe I'll just sort of reiterate too. So please use that mural uh, board that we've set up. Um, if there are any clarifying questions, please put them in the chat during the talk and the moderators will do their best to distill some relevant questions at the end of the talk um, with time that's remaining. Um, as Mariel mentioned, we're gonna, we're gonna be recording these talks and we are gonna make them available. And so with the mural board open for about a week after this symposium, um, you're going to have some time to maybe go back and review some of those recordings and perhaps synthesize some thoughts. And we would appreciate that because um, we've got a lot of a lot of experience in the participant list from today and and yesterday. Any anything else to add, Greg or Andy or anybody else? on on what we're trying to do here no that's a, a, a sort of great introduction thanks will sure and again maybe just reinforcing the idea that we're we're trying to be um receptive and responsive and and the idea that if there's a um a need to carry forward with some of these conversations that um uh, we'd totally be interested in doing so um but on the same note if if it, if it appears um, and we're not sure if, uh, how this is going to fall, but if it appears that that existing venues kind of covers a space of, of of conversation, then that's that's fantastic as well. So again, just um, another relentless plug to get feedback from from you all. We'll we'll also be deploying a Zoom poll, I think, at the mm -hmm. end of today, um, to <clears throat> to get some more immediate feedback for ourselves. Well, perhaps we should just switch over to have Greg share his screen and then I'll uh, I'll introduce Greg in a, in a minute here. That looks great. Well, I think I'll probably just start with your introduction and then we should be on time by the time you, you start. So um, first speaker today is Greg Allen, uh, EPA, Chesapeake Bay Program Office, um, Region 3, sorry. Um, Greg is going to give us an, an overview of everything to do with Chesapeake Bay, uh, both status and trends and, and regulatory aspects. Um, Greg's an environmental scientist with the, the Region 3 Chesapeake Bay Program Office. Um, he helps lead the uh, Toxic Contaminants Work Group for that region, um, whose mission is to develop management strategies um, around contaminant-related goals. Um, he's an analytical chemist, um, has a biology degree from Northwestern University. He's an avid fisherman, and it's that love of fishing that, that really drives his uh, desire to clean all the fish up. 
certainly in Region 3. So, um, Greg, I'll leave it to you to, to dive right in. All right. Thank you so much, Will. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. And so happy to have this chance to talk to you about the Chesapeake Bay and PCBs. So I'm going to start with just some facts to get us oriented to the Chesapeake Bay and its watershed. Uh, you see a map on the left, and the red line is the outline of the watershed boundaries. And this is a 64,000 square mile piece of land that drains ultimately to Chesapeake Bay. And while the bay appears to be reasonably large, and it is the largest estuary in the U.S., it has a shallow average depth, only 21 foot average depth. And that makes it the really powerful uh, estuary and biological factory that we appreciate uh, in the Chesapeake Bay estuary. But it also means it's not the, as large a water volume as we might think. And therefore, what happens on the landscape in that 64,000 square miles has a very large impact on the bay. And it makes for a high land to water ratio. In fact, to our knowledge, it's the highest land to water ratio of any estuary in the world. And again, that means that whatever happens on the land has an impact on the on um, the quality of the bay. So what's the big stressor? Well, the big stressor is us. Uh, we have 18 million people in the watershed approximately, and we add a million people each decade. This is a fairly linear uh, set of data on the number of residents. It's pretty predictable that we're gonna add a million people each decade. As you can see in the diagram here, we have just about every kind of land use uh, that you could imagine. Very diverse. We have a lot of agriculture in the watershed. We've got uh, developed areas and we've got everything in between. Uh, unfortunately, all of these contaminants uh, that come off the landscape certainly do impact the bay and its living resources and want to thank Doug Austin who's on today for doing an analysis of the number of species that are under some level of fish consumption advisory in the watershed and we count 33 different species and unfortunately that includes our iconic striped bass which is probably the most economically important species in the bay and uh uh, for example, in Washington, D.C. waters, uh, any striped bass that are caught uh, in those waters, the recommendation from the District of Columbia is no consumption of that fish. No striped bass from D.C. waters should be consumed. Uh, and uh, that, that's an example of the extent of fish consumption advisories that we have. Uh, we have six states and the District of Columbia that own parts of the watershed. So looking at this map and taking it from top to bottom, north to south, we have a little bit of New York State, big chunk of Pennsylvania. That's the Susquehanna River drainage that's very agriculturally intense. We have most of the state of Maryland, a very large portion of the state of Virginia, and then a little bit of West Virginia and Delaware. And uh, the District of Columbia, which is an estate, that's why we often use the term jurisdiction to include DC, um, but we have six states and the District of Columbia that own portions of the watershed. Okay, so hopefully that gets you geographically oriented. Uh, to the Chesapeake Bay and its watershed. So let's start talking about chemical contaminants in the watershed. This is an indicator that we maintain 
uh, for toxic contaminants. What we do here is take the integrated reports that the states create every two years, and that includes the 303D lists of impairments. And we take all impairments that have uh, uh, are related to toxic contaminants, and we overlay them on the 92 modeling segments that are in the tidal waters of Chesapeake Bay. So we break the tidal waters into 92 segments, mostly for our nutrient monitoring and progress tracking. But we use those same segments and we overlay impairments that are based on a toxic contaminant. We've uh, done this, as you can see, since 2010 and recently up, um, completed the 2018 update. We're going to go on now to 2020 and 22, but uh, to this point, we have up to 2018. And you can see that each time we've done this, the number has gone up a bit. Uh, so the gray bar is the number of impair, um, segments that are not impaired by a toxic contaminant, either fully or partially. And the rest of the colors are various categories that are reported for uh, chemical contaminant impairments. You can see the number has crept up over time. In 2010, we were at 71% fully or partially impaired in those segments. And at our last count, we were at 84%. So it uh, has uh, gone up uh, steadily. And we are going to uh, continue with this. And we've got the 2020 and 2022 to do. As you can also see, most of the categories of listed impairment include PCBs. In fact, all of them do at this point. Uh, early on wasn't the case, but now all of them do uh, implicate PCBs. So what is the story with PCBs in the Chesapeake Bay watershed? Well, I'm glad you asked because we have a story map that I would like to share with you. you might be familiar with story maps. It's kind of a, a hot item in uh, the world of GIS and mapping. So I want to share with you our PCB story map. Takes just a few seconds for it to load. And so here we go. So we have a five panel story map. And the first panel is all of the impairments. So this is an interactive map. We can zoom in and zoom out to see the details. Uh, but what this shows is all of the places in the watershed where the states have indicated an impairment based on PCBs. And you can see that it's very extensive. Most of the tidal rivers on both sides of the bay are listed as impaired. Many river stretches are listed as impaired. And so the coverage of these PCB impairments is substantial. One thing you'll probably notice quickly here is that the main stem of the bay, the main part of the tidal waters of the bay, uh, listed as impaired in Virginia, but not in Maryland. And uh, that's due to a policy decision made by Maryland that the fish tissue data that they have for the main stem of the bay is from migratory species that aren't necessarily representative of conditions in Maryland's part of the main stem of the bay. So they have chosen not to list based on those fish tissue values. Uh, we can see though that there are there is one area in Baltimore, uh, main stem tidal waters that is listed. I'll zoom in just to show how we use this map a little bit. And that's right here uh, in, near Baltimore and north of Baltimore where we have Aberdeen Proving Ground, a large DOD facility, and some other sources that uh, all together added up to a listing in the main stem there in, in Maryland. Uh, you can also see interesting that 
the Susquehanna River, uh, which you see here traveling from the top of the bay up through Pennsylvania, um, it is listed as impaired for the entire reach through Pennsylvania. Susquehanna is our largest source of fresh water to the bay. It is the ancient beginning of Chesapeake Bay, and it loads a lot of fresh water to our bay. And interesting that it is listed as impaired. Okay, so that's panel one that shows us all the impairments. The next question is that we answer here is of all those places that are impaired, where do we have PCB TMDLs? So you can see that Maryland has been very busy with uh, TMDL development. Most of the rivers uh, in Maryland uh, have a TMDL in place. So in this panel, we're uh, showing TMDLs that have been reviewed and approved by EPA. So we've got uh, Maryland rivers. Uh, we've got one out uh, western part of the watershed. That's the Shenandoah River. And one part of the Susquehanna in Pennsylvania has a TMDL. Next, we asked of the places that are impaired but don't yet have a TMDL, where is a TMDL under development? Big storyline here for in development TMDLs is the James River. Uh, so zoom in just a little here. Uh, Virginia is busy working on TMDLs for the entire James River. And you can see that this is a long stretch of river miles. Um, and at the bottom of this river, uh, at the confluence with the Chesapeake Bay, is Norfolk and Hampton Roads, very industrialized area. And so we have every kind of land use along the stretch of this river, a really challenging undertaking. Uh, the state is splitting it into Lower James and Upper James to make it a bit more manageable and uh, a really large body of work that's underway to develop a TMDL. Uh, that's most of the TMDLs that are under development right now. Next, we ask, well, how about uh, of those places that are impaired, which are planned for development? Where have we seen a commitment by the jurisdiction to develop a TMDL in the future? And the story here is two of the other major rivers in Virginia that are on the radar for future TMDL development. And when all of that is added together, and when those are completed, we will see uh, a very um, a substantial coverage of in-place TMDLs across the tidal area of, uh, of the Chesapeake Bay and the tidal rivers, and in other parts of the watershed as well. Uh, so lots of impairments. Lots of TMDLs in place and some very big ones that are under development right now. And where does that leave us then? This is our last panel. Given all of that, where is there an impairment that currently doesn't have a TMDL in place or a TMDL in development or plan for development? Uh, and that's what we're showing here in panel five. So how do we use the story map? Well, two ways. First of all, when we're briefing people on this topic, it's really helpful. We can say, we have lots of impairments in the watershed. We have a substantial number of local TMDLs that are in place. Some very large scale TMDLs that are in development and more planned for development. But we also have places where there's nothing right now that's planned and on the books. And so we use it to tell the story, but we also use it strategically to plan the way that we're going to come together and work 
together on PCB TMDLs. Uh, first, are we having larger or smaller number of impairments? For the TMDLs that are in place, are they working? Are they actually creating the response that we're hoping they're creating in the system? As we're developing, what have we learned? What can we share? Uh, times like this, when we come together with other programs to try to make sure that the new TMDLs are as smart as they possibly can be. Same for the ones that are on the radar. And then finally, why are we not moving forward or planning to do something with these other areas? There might be a valid reason. Um, it might also be a capacity issue. Uh, how can we come together to understand any reasons why we're not going to get going on a TMDL in these places pretty soon? So that's the way this story map uh, helps us tell our story and talk about our strategic plan. And um, this was just recently updated. So uh, you all are seeing for the first time here, uh, the 2022 update of the story map. Um, we have a methods document that is behind this. So each time we do one of these, we write a methods and analysis document. It's a bit of an SOP for what data we use and how we go about creating uh, the story map, and we would be more than happy to share any of that with our other colleagues. Uh, if you're interested in creating a story map and you think that we could possibly help you get there more quickly, be glad to talk to you about our experience with creating and using this map. Uh, it really does come in handy. I use it very frequently. Okay, so that is our story map. Uh, and what I'm going to do for much of the rest of the time that I have is run through some highlights that I got from each of our jurisdictions. Um, actually, what I'm going to talk to today is Virginia, Maryland, DC. And in a little bit, you're going to hear lots of details from Delaware. Uh, of course, we value everything that's happening in Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Um, yeah, and so uh, we'd be really happy to talk about that at a future meeting. But today, what I'm going to focus on primarily is Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. that own a big part of the watershed and our title waters. So let's start with a few highlights from Virginia. Um, seeing here their 2022 303D list statistics for PCB impairments. And as we've seen already from maps, this is a very substantial uh, area of impairment across the state. The map that's here in the lower left is um, updated as of 2018. So it doesn't show these new 2022 uh, numbers exactly yet, but it gives us a really nice uh, idea about the extent of impairment. Uh, it's showing rivers and watersheds that are PCB impaired. Uh, all of our states really are using the structure of the Clean Water Act uh, to manage PCB remediation and our plans going forward. Uh, it we feel like it still provides the best organizational structure, particularly for a watershed like ours that has states that act um, uh, and according to their own decision making. Um, and so the structure of the Clean Water Act gives us um, the kind of parts that we can all talk about and the process that we can share together. So you'll see as I run through some state highlights here uh, that the Clean Water Act and its provisions for 303D lists and TMDLs really guides our work. So uh, Virginia following along with that, um, they are 
partitioning their sources into point and non-point. You can see uh, the specific uh, elements here for point sources. It's our NPDES permitted uh, municipal wastewater treatment plants, industrial wastewater, and our permitted stormwater in MS4, in case you don't know that acronym, Municipal Separate Storm and Sewer Systems, MS4. It's the permitted stormwater. And so it falls into the point source bucket. Non-point source is uh, for Virginia really focusing in on how to make sure that the authorities that we have for dealing with contaminated sites uh, is in full effect. And so we've got Superfund or CERCLA, got the RECRA program, the Allowance for Voluntary Remediation, Browns, Brownfields, um, the, that wide assortment of uh, programs that have authorities to help us deal with contaminated sites. A little more from Virginia here. Uh, Virginia moved out pretty early, to my knowledge, uh, in our watershed with making sure that we were getting uh, method 1668 data uh, for uh, places like stormwater, uh, all, all helping us uh, identify sources within things like uh, permitted stormwater outfalls. And so they've been requiring some 1668 level monitoring for quite a while. And the Virginia is relying uh, heavily as we go forward on the pollution minimization plans. So as they finish these TMDLs and get them in place, there will be requirements for PMPs. And that's going to be a place where as I had said before, we can really hope to see all the best thinking about what we know works and doesn't work as well with regard to reducing PCBs. And we're going to see those in the future pollution minimization plans. So uh, again, mentioning a better coordination with uh, divisions in Virginia DEQ to really get at the contaminated sites and uh, searching for ways to understand the unregulated surface load. I was thinking back uh, yesterday to uh, the presentation we saw uh, where there was a model, um, a form of modeling that was looking for where are those unregulated, unmonitored sources that we need to be aware of and track down. Um, and so unregulated surface load fits there as well. Uh, Virginia does its fish monitoring on a cycle. Each, each of our uh, jurisdiction partners in their fish monitoring, they cycle through the sites. Every couple of years, they're trying to hit sites. Um, and so Virginia follows that approach. And I, I know not to get off topic here, but uh, we've heard that a few of our jurisdictions have had to switch over to PFAS monitoring in fish. Um, so you know, hopefully, hopefully we won't see a big gap in PCB fish data. But the fact is they don't tend to change real quickly. I think uh, everyone who's worked on PCBs knows that uh, those concentrations in fish don't tend to dr dramatically quickly change. So uh, this cycling through sites tends to work well for PCB monitoring. So what is Virginia thought to mention as uh, some needs going forward? Well, two kinds of case studies. Um, so they're out of the gate here today uh, with some input of track down study and information on which best management practices or combinations of best management pro, uh, practices are most effective in dealing with PCBs. So that's a really great idea. Uh, we've been 
uh, as a partnership wanting to do smarter track down work. And just in the last couple of years, I think we've made some very big strides there. And I'll mention a couple of those momentarily. So uh, Virginia sticking with the TMDLs and a lot of work that they're undertaking to get the TMDLs in place. All right, let's switch over to DC. Uh, in the District of Columbia, we've got a lot of impact from PCBs. You see here 29 out of 36 um, assessment units uh, impaired for PCBs, takes us to 81%. Extensive fish consumption advisories in DC waters. And these impairments and these PCB impairments are covered by two TMDLs that are in place. Uh, you see here the tidal Potomac and Anacostia been in place since 2007. And then another TMDL that covers the other small tributaries in the District of Columbia. Uh, throughout this set of slides, you, you're going to see uh, uh, URL links. And we're going to get the slides out to everyone so that all of these links are accessible to you. But in this case, uh, we're pointing you to these TMDLs. They are using these um, categories of land cover and regular regulatory status to organize themselves in, in these uh, TMDLs. And this is um, fairly straightforward, uh, but land cover, impervious, pervious, developed, or turf, and forest are the predominant land covers. And yes, even though this is uh, a city, there are some wonderful parks in DC, so a few places where there is a forested land use. And then, um, there are a lot of regulations that apply in DC. We have MS4 permit that covers a large portion of the district. Uh, we have a combined sewer system and the district uh, recently invested a lot in a new tunnel to create a separated storm water and sewer system. That was a great big uh, investment on their part. And of course there is direct drainage that is regulatory. Um, so those are key elements in the way DC organizes themselves under their TMDLs. And the big story in the District of Columbia is the Anacostia River. So we've got a map here of the Anacostia from the Maryland line. So this is a river that is interstate. It is both in the District of Columbia and in Maryland. We're showing here the district's portion of the Anacostia River, which runs right behind our capital, our United States capital, our uh, White House. And so this is sort of the nation's river in a way uh, and is, is just right in the center of Washington, D.C. So very impacted by the heavy urban land uses around the river. Uh, there was a consent decree that led to a full characterization of the river, including its sediment. And that informed the interim record of decision. And we're going to provide a link to that in case you'd like to read it. It's about nine miles of river that have... Um, that are being separated into these action areas, but to include early action areas. So the places where the district is thinking we get the best benefit for um, the first activities related to cleaning up contaminated sediments. And so that's uh, the name of the game now is creating some more detailed plans for these early action areas. Uh, and in this rod, DC has uh, made sure that they've reserved the privilege to use information over time to improve the way 
that the rod is implemented and cleanup happens. And so there's an adaptive management element in here so that we can learn as we go and have the most effective cleanup possible. So the Anacostia is very large scale effort. It's moving right along and advancing very nicely. And uh, there's a lot of good characterization data that is driving the plan. Got here just some more information on the specific things that are envisioned under this cleanup plan. Uh, I was uh, struck yesterday during the Spokane River presentation where we're talking about the importance of dissolved PCBs as opposed to particulate bound PCBs and talking about how they're hard pressed to find organic matter. Well, we're the opposite. Uh, in Chesapeake Bay, we are exactly the opposite. Uh, we get a lot of TSS, uh, a lot of organic matter in our rainwater. And so DC is, an env is envisioning some uh, uh, management practices here really intended on uh, uh, capturing uh, solids and thereby holding back a lot of PCBs because as we know, PCBs would rather be uh, associated with solids with uh, carbon in them than in the water column. Okay, so uh, more here uh, indicating in particular that these open applications continue to be a question for us. And what we're really getting at there is things like building materials that we were going we were talking about yesterday and and their contribution to stormwater loads of PCBs. I think as a community of practitioners on this, we're getting more and more data over time that is surprising to us about the amount of PCB that's in materials that are still in use and trying to understand where they are and how we can go about minimizing the uh, amount of PCB that leaches into stormwater is, is I think becoming a larger and larger question. Uh, DC also points here to uh, the unintentional production. So we didn't really touch on that yesterday. Um, you might know that when we produce things like dyes, pigments and dyes, particularly yellow colored pigment and dye, there is uh, an unintended production of PCBs. Uh, it tends to be lower chlorination, lower uh, weight, PCBs, uh, but they're there. And when we do things like uh, put paint on our roadways, we unintentionally are applying PCBs. So those are a couple of sources that we can learn more about. And as far as needs, well, look, you know, another jurisdiction that's saying the name of the game here is finding our sources. You know, we really want to concentrate on effective track down studies and using the text techniques that are available to find the sources and shut off the faucet. Uh, and altogether, that's going to help us reduce the amount of fish consumption advisory. Now, in this list, um, you see here that uh, DC mentions the Chesapeake Bay Program's fish consumption advisory tool. And I'm just going to take a quick uh, uh, sideline here to introduce you to our fish consumption advisory infographic. What we did here was try to address the entire sequence of recreational angling to consumption of recreational fish, recreationally caught fish. So what you see here is a very simple graphic that says, let's keep the safer fish when we're catching them. Moving to the right, when we share them, 
let's share safer fish. When we choose to consume fish, let's prepare them in a way that reduces the risk, in this case, particularly from PCBs by removing certain parts of the fish. And then let's consume those fish uh, at a frequency and a serving size that conforms to local fish consumption advisories. So uh, this was um, uh, developed under a contract with TetraTac, and we were really careful to have lots of elements in here that I don't have time to point all of them out to you. But what we wanted to do was use this across the watershed and the partnership to uh, raise awareness about PCBs in fish, but also ways to make sure that we have fish in our diets, but uh, we're following and being mindful of fish consumption advisories. Um, the URL that's on this slide links over to all of the outputs from this project. So uh, all of the parts of this are available in English and in Spanish. And there are places, for example, on the bottom banner here uh, where a local jurisdiction can add in a link to local fish consumption advisories. So this can be customized. So we'd be really glad to share this with any other watershed that might be interested or talk to you more about how we did that. Okay, let's hop over to Maryland real quick. Lots of fish consumption advisories in Maryland. And Maryland, uh, as we saw from our story map, has done an amazing work in this area, been working on these TMDLs since 2007. You can see here really a kind of text uh, recap of what we saw in our story map. Lots of impairments. A couple of places that have been delisted over the time that, that uh, they've been looking at this data, gone from category five, which is requires a TMDL, down to two uh, based on fish tissue that will not require uh, a TMDL. So a couple of places that have improved and lots of go ongoing activity, uh, several big scale TMDLs uh, in the Susquehanna drainage, for example. Um, we have a big dam on the Susquehanna and behind that dam is decades of sediment that has accumulated and some questions around PCBs in those sediments and that pool having its own TMDL. Our states, most of them give us these wonderful maps of their impairments. This is the same kind of information, of course, that was on our story map, but here it's broken down to the individual categories that are used for 303D reporting and in our Clean Water Act programs. So that's a pretty uh, in neat way that they present the data and just wanted to show that and see if maybe others would want to emulate that. Um, as far as some of the essentials here, um, uh, there is a model that has been developed in Maryland for its TMDLs. We've done this uh, uh, cooperatively, uh, MDE and VIMS, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And so this is a case where we do have models that support the TMDLs. And uh, that's kind of, that's interesting. That's one area that we're wondering if we can collaborate more effectively on. Uh, each jurisdiction in this case has its own approach to modeling. Is there a way to harmonize those? Is there any interest in that? Uh, and I wanna be sure I mention uh, that um, you saw on that previous slide, a strong connection to MS4 where there is a controllable source of PCBs. And so uh, Maryland just recently released this guidance that is uh, very specific instructions for their MS4 permittees for what's expected as far as identifying sources of PCBs and then making plans to remediate them. 
So um, this link, this is a, a fairly brand new uh, document and it's very well done. It basically lays out uh, a sequence of steps for track down studies that is really informative. Uh, and so if you're looking for help on that front, uh, recommend that you check out this brand new guidance document from Maryland. As far as needs, well, here's a few other common needs. We all need more affordable PCB uh, analytical methods. 1668 is wonderful in terms of its sensitivity, but it's really expensive. That's the high res mass spec method that uh, we've been primarily relying on. There is some hope though, that there'll be another method that will get us the kinds of sensitivity that we need without it being high res mass spec. Uh, and that might be a place that this initiative we've got across our different watersheds can continue to work together. Uh, a couple of needs uh, on the science end. So we have um, a, a goal in the Chesapeake Bay program around science specifically for uh, toxic contaminants and PCBs. And um, this speaks to a couple of our interests. Um, I can uh, mention that a few of our lead researchers, Bertha Kellerup, you see mentioned in the lower left here, looking at how to match up piece, uh, I'm sorry, BMPs really effectively with PCB sources. A very interesting work about maximizing the efficiency of BMPs. We also have Upal Ghosh at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and he has done a lot with um, carbon um, to use sedamite uh, uh, and carbon that's used in remediation. We've got a few sites where it has been piloted, and this is adding uh, carbon amendments to bottom sediment to make PCBs uh, not as biologically available, and some very interesting data behind that that shows quite uh, it's quite effective and reducing concentrations in fish. If you're interested in that, let me know. I can make sure that you can connect with uh, Dr. Ghosh at UMBC. Now, uh, we have one more thing I'm mentioning here. Um, this is back to science needs and uh, going forward with some, some new science. And we're thinking about how to make a contribution to the monitoring that happens in the watershed for PCBs. And in this case, what we're showing is a really simplistic diagram. We're just working on this concept right now, but we see the Anacostia River again. And again, this is just an example, but in a place like the Anacostia, where we're doing lots of remedial work, um, we will be um, uh, starting to remediate bottom sediments and doing other work. Uh, there's a lot of monitoring that happens in the river. So the jurisdiction, as it goes through that remediation, they do some monitoring. What we're wondering though is, uh, is the net uh, uh, release of PCBs, the net loading of PCBs that's coming out of this river into the Potomac River and then eventually to Chesapeake Bay, is all this great work that we're doing having the effect that we thought? Is the net export from the river going down? And so you see a couple of red dots here at the mouth of the river. And the idea is that we would uh, uh, fund some monitoring that would look to see and try to answer that question. Um, at, we know what's happening at the river scale, but at that next level is the contribution to the whole bay system going down. Uh, and if so, we replicate some of those actions and if not, we ask the question, uh, why not? And what have we learned and how can we do it more effectively? So that's a element of monitoring that we may uh, have the chance to push forward to. So uh, lots to talk about. Uh, I know that was rushed and quick, but uh, we have a really big watershed and we have jurisdictions that are doing phenomenal work 
And so we've just been able to give you um, an idea of that today. Here are some points of contact uh, in a few of our states and a few of us at EPA that are uh, frequently looking at where are we going with PCB TMDLs. So I think that was about the time that I had for today. And there's a few minutes for questions and discussion. And uh, thank you all. This is a really cool opportunity. And I hope that we decide to keep working together, all of us, because I know just yesterday I learned so much and it's been really helpful. So thanks, everybody. And are we seeing any questions in chat? We, we definitely are. Yeah. Thanks very much, Greg. That was a great, um, a great overview of a complex multi-jurisdictional system. Um, yeah. So quite a few, uh, questions in the chat and, um, I think maybe a colleague of yours, Dev Murali has responded to some of them. So thanks Dev. Um, a lot of people thirsty for more details here. Um, so maybe I'll just kind of synthesize some of the, a couple of the earlier questions. Um, one by Brandy R. Miller and then Jeff Stern are pretty interested in some of the, the impairment listing protocols and thresholds. So could you maybe just touch on, you know, whether the listings are based on fish tissue thresholds or consumption advisories? And then, and then there's also a sort of follow up looking asking whether the increase in impairment that you see is that is that a function of more data becoming available or um, greater number of contaminated sites and I can repeat that too. I, I think I got that those are two excellent questions and the first part by and large, this is PCBs in fish. The impairments are mostly based on concentrations in fish tissue. There are a few instances of water values exceeding, but very much based on fish tissue concentrations. And Oh, I thought I would remember. What was the second part, Will? The second, the second part was really just about that increase of impairment that you Got put it. on your bar yes. graph and whether that reflects greater data availability. Yeah, yep. And that's spot on because when we started doing these, we were very hesitant to say, this indicates that the conditions in the bay are degrading that we have more impact over time from toxic contaminants. And that was because we weren't sure whether it was reflective of condition or the result of more testing. As time goes on, we're more inclined to suggest that this does indicate that we're headed in the wrong direction. But it, it, it's it's still an open question. So we don't really emphasize that we're absolutely certain. Um, it could be the result of more data being available and the state's work where they're over time getting to uh, getting out to do the characterizations they need to do. But as we do this year over year and the number continues to go up, uh, at some point, we, we should be more inclined to say this could represent worsening condition. Mm -hmm. So there's also a number of questions around, you know, just how you coordinate among multiple jurisdictions like this with multiple contaminants kind of at play. Um, Trevor Needham pointed out there's a consent decree for nutrients within the Bay. And so I wonder if you could just sort of talk a little bit about that coordination between jurisdictions when it comes to PCBs and whether that, um, you know, you can piggyback some of these, some of these contaminants in your approaches. Yeah, well, we certainly do. Uh, if, 
to tell the top level story about Chesapeake Bay restoration, nutrient and sediment issues get the large majority of the resources applied to it. The, the, the Bay-wide cooperative TMDL that's in place uh, that is driven by nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment stressors is uh, uh, by far the, the largest priority in the partnership. So when we're working the toxic contaminant part of it, we are constantly looking for ways to get multiple benefits through the BMPs that are being used for nutrients and sediment. The fact is we haven't gotten particularly far with that because there's not a whole lot of data out there on the efficiency of the BMPs that we track for nutrients and sediment with regard to the way they help other contaminants. So we're kind of at a loss for BMP efficiencies to use for toxic contaminants. And that's one of the things that has kept us from really being able to blend the two efforts together very effectively. Um, so, so for uh, nutrients and sediment, historic baywide cooperative TMDL. For PCBs, we do not have a baywide TMDL. We have all of these local TMD, TMDLs. And sometimes we ask the question, well, why wouldn't we have a baywide TMDL? And, you know, this is very much like the story that we heard from Spokane River yesterday, where we just are hoping that we can avoid that. We'd like to come together and work together efficiently and really focus on fixing the problem as opposed to some of the administrative requirements uh, that are behind a full-scale TMDL. The con to that, though, is that the states tend to work independently. And while we have some cross-state coordination, we probably don't have as much as we would if we had a Baywide TMDL. And, and you can see on the map, we have a lot of interstate transport of PCBs. Susquehanna goes Pennsylvania to Maryland. The Shenandoah touches three different states. The Potomac River PCB TMDL is shared between Virginia and Maryland. We have a lot of interstate issues, but we're kind of working independently. So um, we, we've been playing with the idea of some form of a PCB consortium, which is really a way for our states to come together and work at a at a, at, a, at a more effective scale on this than we currently are and that we can currently provide through our toxic contaminant work group. We have felt at times like this issue needs to be raised up out of our work group and there needs to be something for that cross-state coordination that's more than what we've got going now, but is not a, a Baywide TMDL. Yeah. So the states work pretty independently on PCBs, but we have some interaction. Across. So then maybe, I mean, maybe to sort of relate those cross-jurisdictional comments back to the, you know, the earlier comments about listings, are, are there, are there commonalities in thresholds then among the, the states where, you, you know, they have similar sort of listing targets and, and protocols? Similar, but not identical. So uh, the water quality standards that are used for PCBs are not uniform across the watershed. That was one of the triggers that led to the Baywide uh, Nutrient and Sediment TMDL was harmonizing water quality standards that later led to Baywide allocations of nutrient and sediment pollutants. Um, but Anyway, uh, no, there, there's not a unified set of, of standards and criteria and action levels across the states. Okay. So looking back at the chat there, there are some people sort of wondering about those details. Are those, are there, when in the presentation that you're gonna post with some of those links that you had contained in there, is there the ability to sort of 
find find those sort of details with with uh, listing thresholds and the individual TMDL documents. Uh, maybe eventually, but it would be a bit of a a hunt. Uh, so, uh, you know, what we might do is take an action item to create a table. We've done some of this in the past, but I don't think it's been updated for a while. But a table that shows by jurisdiction uh, the different uh, you know, criteria and thresholds that are used for fish consumption advisory, which triggers a listing, and then any other water quality or sediment quality criteria. Uh, we need to have that all in one place for our watershed. And I don't think we have that at the moment, but maybe that would be a good follow-up that we could share back with everyone. Yeah, yeah, it does seem like there's a lot of people thirsty for those sort of details. Um, so just to remind people, we will be posting um, the presentation so that they're, they're available, which will then give you access to some of those links. I noted that Marielle had posted a couple of links. We posted the link to um, the, the PCB story map in the chat. Uh, Marielle's posted a link to um, the Maryland MS4 guidance document. Um, awesome. Great. I don't know. So I think we're kind of winding down on time here, but perhaps, Greg, you could take a scroll through the, the, the chat for other unanswered questions um, and maybe put some of those links in if you, if you have the time today. Um, Sure, be glad what to. Time, what time are we at? We got a couple more minutes. Let's see here. Um, Robert Mott's asking again about uh, um, another question about the percentage impaired. So this is relative to your um, bar plot. Um, so are those are those the number of impairments or is is there sort of concentration data in there that's just those are just accounts is that correct yeah this is just strictly uh, we we use some nifty gis to overlay the geography of the impairments over the tidal water segments and again if it's a full overlay or a partial impact on a segment it's counted as an affirmative and that's that's all this is is yes or no is there a full or partial overlay of an impairment on a tidal segment to learn more about those impairments we would back up through the state's listings and the state's data great well, we should probably begin transitioning to the next speaker. So thanks again, Greg, great overview. It does look like um, colleagues of yours have been replying to some of the, the questions in the chat. All right. So you're thank off you. the hook for some of them. Team. Uh, well, we've got a great team. So uh, thank you everybody who's helping out with that. I don't recall who's who do we have moderating the next? Joel is moderating and we've got John. John, if you wanna pull up your slides. John, are you ready to go? Looks like you are. We're not getting it. I'm not hearing John. Sorry about that. I I unmuted or I couldn't find the unmute. I'm going to share again here and then we'll get rolling. There's 30 ways to go wrong doing this when we all That's right. find all 30 of them usually. So. Uh, okay. it, just confirm you can see my here. slides again. Yep. Er everything's looking good and we can hear you. So. All right. Fantastic. Uh, well, first, uh, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, the Delaware River and what we're doing here in Delaware. Um, 
I feel like we have a lot of maybe, maybe I can close some of the gaps and some of the discussions that were brought up a few minutes ago or or that have been brought up already this morning, uh, because we do have some interesting things going on here in the Delaware River Basin. Um, what I'd like to focus on today is, is just some basic information on the Delaware River, uh, like others have done. And then I, I want to talk about the Delaware River Basin Commission and, and our PCB TMDLs for the Delaware River. And then I think I'm going to spend about half of my time uh, on Delaware's approach uh, to, to help and accelerate some of our, our PCB reductions uh, in the estuary and then provide a little example if there's some time left over. Um, so first and foremost, let's get ourselves oriented again. Um, Delaware's at the little corner there on the Delmarva Peninsula. You know, Greg just talked about the Chesapeake Bay there on the west side of the peninsula. So I'm going to talk about uh, the Delaware River on the east side of the Delmarva Peninsula there. Uh, the Delaware River and Basin, uh, just so, kind of factually, uh, is the longest undammed river east of the Mississippi. We've got uh, both tidal and non-tidal environments, uh, stretches 330 miles, entirely interstate, meaning that on either side of the river, there's a different jurisdiction anywhere you are along the river. Um, headwaters begin up in upstate New York, and uh, the mouth of the, of the river is located down near Cape May, New Jersey and Lewis, Delaware. Uh, where it drains into the Atlantic. And we've got over 2,000 tributaries, 216 of which are classified as major tributaries. Um, the non-tidal portion stretches about 200 miles from New York to Trenton, New Jersey. And then uh, the tidal portion extends about 133 miles uh, from Trenton down to the mouth. Now this basin includes uh, 10 main subwatersheds, and this is a DRBC a Delaware River Basin Commission map that uh, I took from their website that shows those 10 watersheds or subwatersheds. Uh, it extends across five physiographic regions, uh, includes three states and one commonwealth, 42 counties, 868 municipalities. Uh, and then here's some statistics about uh, water usage. You know, 13 plus million people rely on, on the Delaware River for their drinking water or for agriculture, agricultural or industrial use. Uh, almost six and a half billion gallons of water withdrawn daily from the river. We support two of the largest cities uh, in the nation, those being Philadelphia and New York City. Uh, 850 million gallons of days consumed from the river and not returned to the river. Uh, and this river does support uh, a tremendous number of jobs and over $20 billion in water-based economy annually. Needless to say, it's important for the region. Uh, a very brief pollution history uh, sounds very similar to everything else I've heard from, from other uh, you know, watersheds across the country, but industrialization really really uh, played a part in, in, in the decline of the river quality. Um, what I gathered from, from this link that I put on here in an article about the death of the Delaware River, um, it's really the, the DO uh, dissolved oxygen uh, was so low that, that aquatic life just couldn't survive at all. Uh, by 1964, I found the statistic that about a million pounds of non-disinfected waste per day were being just discharged by the sewage treatment plants along the river, uh, as well as some industries. And that also included slaughterhouse waste, oil from refineries, uh, and a lot of chemical companies that that found its home along the banks. Now, sturgeon and shad are two of the uh, uh, important species in the Delaware River, uh, among plenty of others, uh, but they all but disappeared at, at one point in time. Now in 1961, uh, the governors of Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, along with President Kennedy, uh, signed legislation creating the Delaware River Basin Commission. Uh, their charge was to oversee a unified approach, just like we were just talking about, uh, to managing a river system without regard to the political boundaries. And I think things were rather slow at the beginning, but, you know, after uh, the Clean Water Act passed in 1972, you know, things started to, uh, to move forward a little bit. And uh, we've seen noticeable improvement over time, and, and we continue to uh, put a lot of effort in regionally. Um, to continue the, the improvement of, of this resource. Now, the Delaware River Basin Commission uh, has several functional responsibilities in the basin, only one of which is water quality. 
Um, so you can see here, there's plenty of other things that they do. We're going to focus on the water quality aspects a little bit. Now, if you do want to take a tour of the Delaware River Basin, uh, a lot of nice pictures of all the different environments uh, throughout, you know, from, from the headwaters all the way down to the mouth. I've, I've added a link here for, for everybody. And then for more information about the Delaware River Basin Commission itself, uh, because there is a, a lot of information, um, I've given you a link to their website as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail about DRBC, but instead talk about the things that DRBC does with the basin states uh, that are helping us to improve water quality. So we're here to talk about PCBs. Uh, I want to start out just by throwing this slide up here, and, and it shows the different uh, aquatic life and human health criteria that are in the, the DRBC regulations. Um, the main focus that, that I'll put you on here is the human health uh, water quality standard at, at 16 parts per quadrillion. So 16 picograms per liter uh, drives most of, uh, of what we do from you know, the risk components uh, in, in the basin and in the river. Now I did, uh, I, I found this or was, was provided this uh, awesome map by, by DRBC the other day. And it's one of the more recent sediment quality monitoring uh, efforts that DRBC themselves conducted. Now they they do a lot of ambient uh, river studies, um, water quality studies uh, throughout you know the entire uh, river. This is just one of the studies that was done in 2016 to look at sediment quality uh, related to PCBs. Um, really, it, it kind of the map says it all. There are plenty of spots. Uh, that have big red dots. There are plenty of spots that have a little bit smaller uh, orange dots. For reference, uh, I'll just throw out one number. Uh, my predecessor here in Delaware uh, calculated a bioaccumulation based sediment quality criterion, just sort of as a screening tool. Uh, that number's uh, 33.2 parts per billion. Um, you equate that to this map uh, in parts per trillion, uh, it'd be the 33,200, of course. So uh, you know, any of the midway through the yellow dot all the way up into the orange and into the red uh, shows PCB concentrations at levels that could bioaccumulate to a point that causes some impact to the fish. So again, this 2016 data does show that sediment is a significant source of PCBs in the river, uh, understanding their distribution, uh, their concentrations and their chemical signatures have really helped us to kind of pinpoint sources. Um, and we carry on with this, you know, we do some of our own monitoring in Delaware. Uh, I'm sure DRBC will do another round in the coming years of sediment sampling to see if we've, we've made any improvements. Now, similarly with sediments uh, in the estuary itself, uh, I found this plot uh, in, in an older presentation, uh, but I found it very interesting and I find it very useful in just depicting that the, the fringe marshes along the Delaware River uh, do have an assimilative capacity for uh, collecting and burying these PCBs that are in the system. Um, each of these sediment cores, uh, you know, or these plots, boxes, were a different sediment core from a different fringe marsh somewhere in, in the basin. And um, between the, the cesium-37 oh, cesium lead-210 dating and the PCB analyses, uh, you know, what these plots show is that we've seen the worst and concentrations at the surface uh, in the sediments are certainly much better than they are at depth, um, which is a good thing, but it does also again show that there is a pretty significant repository of PCB laden sediments that are buried in these marshes. So it's just something to keep in mind uh, as we move through sea level rise, we move through other things that, that we're gonna have to consider. There, there is this inventory of PCBs. Now, from a fish quality standpoint, uh, I searched pretty hard uh, to find good plots that were um, had a long record. And although some of these end, uh, it's this one says 2001, I think that last data point might have been 2012. Um, we do have a little bit more data um, that I haven't added to these plots yet. But the gist of uh, this and the next two plots are that, you know, concentrations in fish over time are going down. Uh, but they're still significantly high enough uh, to cause human health impacts. So this is the longest record that, that I was able to find uh, for white perch in the estuary. 
Uh, and uh, I'll explain these zones here in a minute, but these are averaged concentrations across uh, the entire Delaware River um, from the top all the way down to the bay. Uh, and again, the PCB levels, like, like I said, are dropping. So, you know, that's good news, right? Uh, our channel catfish, which are tied to the sediment a little bit more, the concentrations are a little bit higher. You see here in, in the maybe the, the thousand um, PPB range, but they started much higher than that. And again, the data is improving over time, uh, which means we're doing something. Finally, uh, you know, Greg mentioned striped bass in this area of the country. Uh, it certainly is a, a major species and one that's consumed and fished for quite a lot. Uh, this river or this plot actually shows two different data sets. Here, the river at the top, uh, that's the upper part of the estuary. I'd say uh, it says zone five. Again, I'm going to explain the zones in a minute. Uh, but this is the upper estuary, kind of where uh, the spawning grounds are for for these particular fish and concentrations have certainly dropped over a couple decades time. Uh, the bay samples that we have here were from the, the lower bay um, and shows the same story. They just they just don't have as many PCPs uh, in the early days as the lower part or the upper part of the river. And, and you know, from the industrialization standpoint, I'm not surprised by that. So let's uh, let's shift a little bit to um, the TMDL. What I what I really wanted to show with these previous slides is that, you know, we certainly do have a problem. There's no no surprise there, um, but things are improving. Uh, aside from that, I'm not really getting into concentrations too much. The fish still aren't great to eat. We have advisories all over the place. Uh, so I want to I want to focus more here on on the things that we're doing to improve water quality and try to get those concentrations down. And so he, here's the the zone. Uh, designation that I was mentioning. Uh, DRBC has has separated the basin into these six zones, um, where zone six is here at the bottom, zone two and one are up here at the headwaters. My jurisdiction in Delaware starts here in zone five, uh, which is our upper part of the estuary, uh, and then zone six down in the bay. Uh, you know, we we regulate that portion of of the Delaware River and Bay. Um, zone three to upper zone five is typically urban uh, and industrial. Uh, when you get down into zone six, it's much more agricultural and rural and, and a lot of marshland uh, down here toward in the bay. So the, the Delaware estuary was listed originally, I want to say in the, in the mid to late 1990s as impaired by PCBs. And between DRBC, EPA and the basin states, uh, a stage one PCB TMDL was established. Now, the, the TMDL for zones two through five was established in 2003. And uh, in zone six, it was established in 2006. Um, we do have this uh, PCB water quality criterion of 16 picograms per liter that I mentioned. That was not the criterion when these uh, TMDLs were developed, uh, but this criterion was adopted by DRBC back in 2013, and it does apply to uh, the entire river. Uh, and tidal tributaries. Um, now, I also have in here that there's a stage two uh, TMDL currently in development, and I'll, and I'll hit on that briefly in a few minutes. So the stage one uh, TMDL uh, has a certain set of requirements, and a lot of this we've heard about from other jurisdictions in the last couple of days. Uh, one thing that is required is monitoring using, uh, you know, method 1668A. So uh, all the jurisdictions are required to use this congener based method. Um, the development of pollution minimization plans is something we've heard already, uh, certainly something that's included in this TMDL as well. Uh, and then implementation of you know, minimization measures um, uh, to, to reduce the concentrations that are discovered through the PMPs and, and the actions taken through PMPs. Um, the monitoring and the PMPs are primarily required through NPDES permits uh, or directly through DRBC regs. And, and I'm happy to say that there's over 90% of the dischargers in the basin participate and have uh, PMPs in place uh, or have that requirement in their NPDES permit. Um, now, the part that I've heard a little bit more question about and one thing that I can say here is that DRBC does coordinate all TMDL activities 
between EPA region two and three, as well as the basin states. And DRBC developed a database to house all of this PCB data, and they maintain that PCB database um, at DRBC up in Trenton. So again, this is nothing necessarily new with the PMPs. Obviously, the goal is reduce PCB loadings to the estuary. Key elements being source identification, monitoring, reporting, and remediation activities or, or concentration reduction activities. And the approaches that are typically used uh, within the PMPs, track down studies, nothing new here. Um, removal of you know the easy sources, PCB transformers and capacitors, um, contaminated sediment obviously as a source, uh, controlling that or removing that where available or where possible. You know, controlling solids in a in a industrial process is is one of the PMP approaches that we found to be helpful. Uh, and then investigating this advertent PCB production. Uh, we do have at least one, if not two, that I'm aware of in, in Delaware's jurisdiction um, that, that were inadvertently producing PCB, PCBs and discharging them to the river. And they were identified, and, and we did work with that facility to try to minimize that. Um, overall, I'd say that the reductions that we've seen um, or have been seen in municipal industrial dis in, and industrial discharges uh, across the estuary. This particular plot I've added in here is from the city of Wilmington's uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, effluent. And, uh, you know, they, they've had a major reduction um, since 2005 when they started implementing their PMPs. Um, I don't think I put this anywhere else in, in the presentation, uh, but probably one of the primary reasons that, that they were able to get such great reduction was through clean out of the piping systems. Uh, and a lot of that residual, you know, PCB laden sludge or sediment that's in in their piping networks, uh, continually uh, putting PCBs into the system. So once they did the clean out, uh, major reduction seen there. Uh, again, here it says the ten largest point sources uh, have reduced loadings by seventy six percent since two thousand five. Um, and then all of the point sources uh, within the TMDL have shown reductions of 64% between 25 or 2005 and 2013. So again, I, you know, I'd say this is a success, right? Um, and that's the conclusion that DRBC has made and that the states I think have made as well is that uh, you know, the implementation of this P PCB TMDL has um, achieved some success and, and is working. Uh, the realization is that it was a good start, but we have a long way to go. Um, so just to, kind of to conclude, uh, you know, the, the PCB TMDL part of this, um, some of the essential elements to its success have been consistent monitoring, consistent analysis and data, uh, and the consistent reporting back to DRBC so, so that all that data can go into the database, you know, continued implementation of these PMPs, um, and working with the jurisdictions obviously has been a benefit. And we found that when we work together collaboratively, um, things seem to, to go a lot uh, more smoothly. Uh, here it says we foster that environment of collaboration. And it's something that myself and my colleagues uh, believe in very highly. Uh, we would much rather see improvement uh, towards the goal and work with folks on getting there than you know, coming in with a regulatory hammer and saying you didn't meet your allocation or you didn't meet your goal, uh, so now we're going to make you do this, that, and the other. Um, as long as there's progress being made, I think life is pretty good and, and we can keep moving forward. Now, how does it manifest itself in fish consumption? Um, you might ask. Uh, <laughs> I asked. Um, so the result is that we've been able to change some of the fish advisories uh, in the Delaware River over the past decade. In 2013, Delaware, in conjunction with New Jersey, uh, as well as DRBC, uh, changed the threshold of consumption from do not eat to eat one a year. And that doesn't sound like much to, to most people, certainly the public, um, but to all of you, you probably understand because you're in this game, um, Shifting that from from not eating anything to actually being allowed to eat something, you know, was a big step. 
uh, and, and it changed the trajectory, if you will, uh, of, of the trend. And in 2018, we were able to change it yet again, and we went from one meal a year to three meals a year for you know this portion of, of the river. And uh, again, I'm happy to say that I have even more data, I collected more data from uh, the CND Canal, which is in this area, uh, the CND Canal uh, actually connects the Chesapeake Bay to the Delaware River. Uh, and the channel catfish that I sampled in there in 2019 showed an additional 50% reduction or so across the board in PCBs in their flesh. Uh, so again, I think we're going in the right direction. We're seeing some improvements and, and I'm hopeful that in the coming years, we'll be able to uh, lessen uh, the severity of this advice even more. So I mentioned earlier this draft stage two PCB TMDL. Uh, and, and one of the things that was supposed to come out here is lessons learned, right? And we've been we've been working with these TMDLs uh, as an agency for close to 20 years. Um, so we have learned some things and I think there's some things that uh, would be helpful if they change. So, uh, you know, the draft stage two TMDL has a few differences than the stage one TMDLs. Uh, and to highlight the primary uh, differences is it, it uh, revises the water quality standard in the TMDL to the 16 picogram per liter uh, criterion. There was updated current source loads across the basin. So, you know, all the information that the states provided to DRBC about, uh, you know, NIPTES discharges, MS4s, all, all of the source categories were sort of recalculated into an updated uh, loading structure. And then, the, you know, to me, maybe most importantly, is there's a proposed change in the allocation procedure um, for the TMDLs uh, that started with an equal percent reduction kind of framework where, you know, we wanted everybody, especially the large dischargers, to, uh, you know, reduce their percentage of contribution or load by at least 10 percent or, you know, at least 20 uh, percent. Um, and what we found is that through, you know, reductions are, are obviously much more than that at this point. So changing that now, uh, I think, is a great idea in the proposed changes to an equal effluent concentration sort of procedure. And in, in this type of procedure, every source category uh, is assigned an allocation, not just the NIPTES or not just, uh, you know, the point sources. But, uh, you know, any any source category that was included in the TMDL we can actually calculate an allocation very simply uh, by taking the flow component and multiplying it by the criterion minus the margin of safety, which in this case is 15.2 picograms per liter. Um, it makes it very simple in, in comparison to calculate loads uh, or targets for any load. Um, and, and once we achieve this, obviously we're, we're achieving the water quality criterion uh, coming out of the pipe. And that's a wonderful thing that we're to strive for. Uh, obviously, the, we're not there yet. Um, now, allocations within the stage two, the draft stage two, uh, have also been updated by source category. Uh, there's 83 contaminated sites included in it, as well as you know other source categories. And then there's also some updated PMP approaches uh, in this new uh, draft PCB TMDL um, that's being reviewed at EPA at this point. Now to kind of put this into a picture, um, I chose two, two plots out of the stage two PCB TMDL that I thought were interesting to share with everybody. In this case, uh, these are the blue bars are the current calculated load uh, within the, the stage two PCB TMDL. And the orange bars are the TMDLs based upon this equal effluent allocation procedure. Now this uh, plot definitely shows that, that we have more work to do and we have a ways to go to get there. Um, but in, in each zone has work to do. Again, here in Delaware, I'm looking more at zone five and zone six. So we're part way there, got to keep moving. Secondarily, this plot uh, shows the source categories and, and sort of the same structure. Uh, the blue bars are the current load and the, the yellow bars or orange bars are what the uh, total allocation is per source category. So uh, the most important one I want to show is this one right here, contaminated sites. Uh, 
a lot of load coming in from contaminated sites based upon the data provided and the allocation is very, very small. And so I take this to you know, use as my transition, if you will, into something that, that I'm much more in tune with and that's what Delaware is doing to help. And we are focusing very heavily on waste sites, uh, certainly not entirely, uh, but we, we see this as one of the primary uh, things that we can do to, to help everything in the estuary itself. So let's talk about DENREC's approach to the problem. Um, again, keeping in mind that uh, jurisdictionally, we only have a small portion of the Delaware River estuary. Um, but if you look at some of those concentrations in the sediment and in the fish, we have some of the higher uh, source areas or, or some of the, the higher concentrations in the sediment. And it's due to some of our, you know, the industry along the river and then it happens to fall within our jurisdiction. All that said, our approach has been a very holistic one. We want to work throughout the watershed, um, not just in the water body. We're not just on the banks. You know, we're looking at the watershed as a whole. Uh, we're trying to be very collaborative. And as I've explained, you know, we're partners in, in a sense with the RBC and EPA in this. We've all agreed to be part of the solution and we continue to do our part in that collaborative effort, especially with regard to the TMDL requirements. And then uh, thirdly, I've got here through WATAR. And, and I'm gonna say WATAR a lot in the next you know, bit of slides. That is a, a, a program that was put together here in Delaware. I wanna say around the 2009 timeframe is when it really started to form. And essentially what the program does is combine the, the goals of multiple sections in DENREC, uh, DENREC being the uh, Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. So that's, it's the agency I work for. But we've combined uh, goals of our remediation section, which is driven by circular and recro style cleanup programs and, and rules uh, with our watershed assessment and management section, uh, which is the group I work for now, and our surface water discharges section, both of which are driven by Clean Water Act requirements. And, and most of you I'm sure have been around enough to know that uh, CERCLA and RECRA and Clean Water Act are, are somewhat like oil and water, maybe like PCBs and water. Uh, they don't like to play together. So we've gone about trying to figure out how we can make them play together better uh, to achieve all of our goals. So what is WATAR? Uh, WATAR is a watershed approach to toxic assessment and restoration. It is a kind of whole basin management approach. Um, we're looking throughout the entire watershed, uh, focusing on persistent bioaccumulative and toxic compounds. Uh, which are our risk drivers for fish consumption advisories in the state, primarily PCBs, but also you know dioxins and furans, chlorinated pesticides, um, you know the, the common list of, of characters that that are driving risk in fish uh, across the country. What we try to do with this program is link the sources and the sinks, um, and take care of those sources prior to looking at the sink, if you will. Um, and do this in, in sort of a, a logical approach um, instead of a, you know going in and just doing one-off projects here and there. We're really trying to, to, to bring it together again holistically. And our major goal uh, in Mantra is fishable, swimmable, and potable in the shortest time frame possible. Uh, when we started this program, we had a set of objectives. We wanted to first compile toxics data for you know all media, surface water, sediment, and biota. Uh, primarily in our 303D listed water bodies, and then kind of create this clearinghouse of, of data, um, which we do in an Equus database, which is the Envir Environmental Quality Information System database. Um, again, sampling in our priority waters, the 303D listed waters. Uh, we want to establish TMDLs if necessary, um, but more importantly, alternatives to TMDLs if we can, if we can do that as well. One of the things we really try to do is identify high priority remediation sites. Um, we, we want to prioritize our resources and spend our money where we're going to get the best benefit. So prioritization is a big key for us in, in Delaware here. And then internally, we want to facilitate this technology transfer with, with our um, staff and, and it kind of incorporate um, the WATAR culture, if you will, into management decisions. And I'd say we're having some success in that. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, our predecessor in this program or, or one of our early partners really uh, nailed into our heads as, as younger staff 
uh, many years ago is that we should get the highest quality data possible. Uh, and so we do that. Um, when we do did these uh, comprehensive watershed scale sampling events, these are the parameters that we were analyzing all of our samples for sediment, water, and fish. I'm just pointing out here that uh, we used EPA method 1668 for all media, with the exception of a few of the sediments, uh, we ran a homolog method, EPA method 680. So how do we use this data? Clearly, we want to document trends, uh, hopefully positive ones in the fish contamination. Um, we want to improve or justify our, our listings through the 303D program uh, and maybe even delistings, right? Uh, I've mentioned we want to identify and prioritize uh, targeted cleanups. Um, one of the things we have been able to do with the data sets we collected are, are to calculate site-specific bioaccumulation factors and biota sediment accumulation factors, uh, which can be useful in, in you know, assessing certain data. Um, we've used the information to support natural resource damage assessment evaluations uh, and, and actions based upon uh, natural resource damage assessments. And we support a lot of programs throughout the department now um, that need to address a toxic contaminant issue of some kind. So this is just a listing when I say we did this kind of comprehensive, we took five or six years and, and hit all these different watersheds throughout the state, collecting sediment, water, and fish, co-located where we could, uh, added a lot more where we knew there were waste sites, those sorts of things. Uh, but uh, I want to focus on this one in 2015. Um, in this map here, you can see this is the Delaware River and Bay. Uh, so we do have all these uh, these industrial areas in the northern part of the state, impaired watersheds here. We have fewer as you move, move south, um, which I guess is good for us. It's <laughs> we, we can get around the state relatively simply. We have about a six year rotation on all of our uh, fish tissue sampling. So we get back to each watershed every six years or so. But let's look at this uh, Christina River Basin, which is this northern uh, portion of the state. Um, in 2015, the WATAR program collected 65 sediment samples, 25 surface water samples, and 25 fish tissue samples you know, throughout these watersheds. Now, this map actually shows uh, the data compared to that bioaccumulation-based sediment quality criterion that I mentioned earlier, that 33.2 parts per billion, and they're just orders of magnitude. Uh, so really, I'm going to focus you in on the yellow and the red. Uh, if, if, we, if I went back to the sediment map, you would see that one of the large red circles is right here at the mouth of the Christina River. Uh, and that's where all of these samples were collected here. Uh, clearly, we have a hot spot. And so we went about trying to talk about what we do about that. And if we can clean up this problem within our jurisdiction, we help the overall quality of the Delaware River. It's all tidal through here, and we're exchanging water every day. Um, so what do we do? We coordinate among our programs and try to you know, utilize this holistic approach, if you will. And we all have, have learned at this point that these are our main sources of PCBs, at least what goes into the calculation of a TMDL. Um, and so we, we've tried to hit on all of those things through the WATAR program. Uh, I'm going to throw some highlights up here. Uh, we've been working with uh, the city of Wilmington, uh, who has a NIPTES permit to discharge their treated wastewater to the Delaware Estuary. Um, through some help with the WATAR program, we developed work plans. Uh, they went about sampling, uh, doing the doing the track back studies, and, and as I showed earlier, they had a 70 plus percent reduction uh, in their discharge. Uh, up to about 2016, and they have continued to look into their sewer sheds. And, uh, you know, this is one of our greatest success stories, I think. Uh, a tremendous amount of work has been done in identifying uh, and isolating sources of PCBs through that sewer shed uh, kind of facility layout. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail about those today, but it is one of those things that's ongoing. Uh, and, and as they find sources through the PMP, they're able to, uh, you know, correct some of those sources and take credit in their plans, their minimization plans for doing so. Um, just, just a real good project that we've been a part of uh, there. Now, uh, Newcastle County, which is the northern county there in Delaware, as well as the Delaware Department of Transportation, have an MS4 permit, a joint MS4 permit. 
uh, and the WATAR program uh, back in 2014 and 2016 assisted uh, with, with the development of a sampling and analysis plan design uh, and an approach to, to look at the data. Um, and again, this is all being done through the PMP and the actions that, that Newcastle County and DelDOT take. Uh, we encourage them to you know, take credit for the work that they do uh, and report it to uh, DRBC. And here I've again noted that compliance through progress uh, really does solidify the partnerships we have and we're making progress. A quick example of that, um, this is the Newcastle County data. I'll draw your attention to this point right here, which is along that Christina River area that, that we were just highlighting. This is the small sewer shed that exists where this sample was taken at this little yellow dot. It also happens to be uh, in between a major source uh, of PCBs on the left-hand side of that image, um, which was, a, it was an old, um, a metal recycling facility. And then they, we also had PCB sources on the other side here uh, in this, this marshy area. Uh, there was some Amtrak derived waste right here in this bottom corner. Uh, there actually still is a landfill, PCB landfill there, but it's all been, been controlled. Now, because of all the source control that was done and that we knew about, uh, we were able to uh, request and work with the jurisdictions there uh, to clean these pipes out. Uh, and we removed all of the sludge that, or they removed all the sludge that was in those pipes, uh, which was the ongoing source of PCB discharge into this ditch, which uh, just off the screen goes right into the Christina and, uh, you know, very quickly into the Delaware River. So it's just a, a quick example of how um, that kind of, that, that track back in the MS4 worked. Um, these are, again, just order of magnitude dots. And in this case, uh, what we compared to was a rainwater background sample. So 357.2 picograms per liter in the rain. Uh, we certainly weren't going to target areas that were that concentration, but instead focus on some of the areas that had the higher concentrations, you know, greater than 10 or a thousand times uh, or 10 or a hundred times those background concentrations. Now, another thing that we do is obviously coordinating with our remediation section. They're part of the WATAR team. Now, all these green outlines are regulated sites along this small area of the, uh, the Christina River. Uh, again, just off the screen here is um, the Delaware River. So having information about all these regulated sites allowed us to do a very powerful thing. Um, one of the things that we did and really what started this whole WATAR program was coordinating on, on this one particular site. Um, a lot of PCBs, uh, some of this was left in place, but, uh, you know, the one, the one jurisdiction said, you know, you can release or, or let X amount go. Uh, we're only going to encapsulate this much. Uh, our watershed program at the time came in and said, Hey, you know, if you put that in there, it, it exceeds all of our criteria. So can, can we work together here and come up with a better solution? And they did come up with a better solution. And again, that sort of catalyzed, uh, this relationship between the remediation section and our watershed assessment program, uh, our watershed assessment and management sections to say, hey, let's work together and achieve this goal and make sure that the discharge from this waste site does not exceed the criteria out here in the river or isn't going to, uh, you know, work to uh, impact the resources that we're trying to clean up. And, and so one of the things that was done at that point in time, that was 2009, uh, we commissioned a study uh, by one of the local consultants. They mined all of our remediation section data uh, and sites, pulled out every PCB hit uh, from any soil sample, from any groundwater sample, and, and effectively did a, uh, a loading calculation. Uh, and so here's just the, you know, the, the covers of these reports. Uh, one was in 2009, one was in 2015. And, and they calculated using the, the unified soil loss equation, essentially a load coming off of the contaminated site. And what we were able to do with that then is create a priority list, look at uh, which sites were loading the most. And it didn't have to be perfect science. It really just put everything against each other and allowed us to prioritize. We've used that information uh, to, to target and make sure that we're cleaning up the, the sites that are creating the greatest impacts. And I did an update in 2017, kind of revisited the list. Uh, and this was in, uh, in relation to 
providing information to DRBC for the stage two PCB TMDL, we wanted to make sure all of uh, our contaminated site information was correct within the new T, uh, TMDL. Uh, and in going through that exercise, I was able to reduce the number of uncontrolled waste sites from 58 to 22, meaning that those sites were either remediated through removal or in, in, in many cases capping um, to remove that overland flow component uh, so I could take that load down to zero. And what I was able to do you know, calc with the calculations was reduce the loads from all of the sites by about 48%. Uh, and that was again reflected then in uh, the draft stage two PCB TMDL. So it's a lot more accurate within our jurisdiction. Here's our top 10 list, uh, just real quickly to show you that. This was based upon the, the 2009 assessment of loads. Um, you can see we've crossed out the ones here that have uh, been remediated and no longer have a load. And there are four left in our top 10, including the top three, uh, but they are all Amtrak sites. They're all pretty nasty. Uh, the good news is that we have plans in place. Uh, we issued a final plan in August of 2020 for the one site. Uh, issued a plan for Feb in February 2022 for the second site. They are contiguous and will be remediated together. It's about a $55 million remediation uh, for Amtrak, and that is moving forward right now in the planning and permitting stages. One of their other yards uh, in the state is number three on our list, and we actually have a remedial investigation that's been completed for that site, so we're well on our way. The last one here is going to be capped by 2024. We'll be able to eliminate that, and at that point, we'll, we'll produce a new top 10 list, <coughs> excuse me, and start going at it again. Now, one of the other things that we've done within programs, uh, in particular, the remediation section program, is try to create some policy that, uh, that helps the overall. Uh, and in this case, we developed a PCB policy, and effectively, we removed the use of method 8082, the Aerochlor method, at waste site characterizations. Uh, we add a minimum require homolog method of 680, uh, and we put uh, provisions within this policy uh, for use of method 1668 if the site's in, in a proximity to a 303D listed water body, we want that data, uh, the specific high, high quality data to look at potential sources. Um, and so we require that uh, through policy. Uh, and that's been, it's been uh, met, I'd say in a mixed way, we're starting to get the regulated community on board with what we're doing here. It has taken almost 10 years, um, but it's working. And now we're getting high quality data. We're getting a better assessment of, of you know, the full uh, inventory of PCBs on these waste sites so we can do something about it. Now, another thing that we've got going that's currently in draft right now is a mass loading guidance, uh, just like we asked uh, or commissioned the consultant to do back in 2009 and 2015 uh, to estimate loads coming off the sites uh, for PCBs. We're trying to, uh, to figure out the best way to do this, but creating this policy uh, for this to be done during an RI stage, potentially, uh, where, where loads are calculated and reported to DENREC so we could put them on our list. Uh, I think we're going to primarily work towards the 303D listed watersheds first and, and try to uh, you know, calculate loads or have loads provided to us uh, for the uh, primary PBTs you know, that, that were listed for in those watersheds. So it won't be every contaminant, but it would be PCBs. It would be you know, some of the pesticides, those sorts of contaminants that are driving uh, fish tissue risks in the water bodies. So another thing with our WATAR program we're involved with is innovative remediation. You know, you've heard Sedamite mentioned a couple of times, and we have worked with uh, Dr. Upal Ghosh on, on numerous occasions. Uh, the Mirror Lake study was one of the first in the country to use Sedamite. That's this big picture in the middle. Uh, it was a five-acre uh, part of a, a river uh, down in, in the middle of Delaware, and we're actually going to go back next year and do a 10-year post-application study on that. So that, that was done almost 10 years ago now. Uh, so we were thrilled to be involved with that and, and work with uh, Dr. Ghosh on, on this particular project. Um, we've also uh, been working with some in-situ stabilization techniques. This picture on the right is uh, appetite-based fish bone uh, that we put into a permeable reactive barrier to uh, sequester metals um, that were discharged into the Delaware River. We've uh, done some remediation using mats, uh, reactive core mats, 
And these last two photos here on the bottom left is one of our more recent uh, remediation uh, pilot studies, the A Street Ditch, where again, we, uh, we worked with UMBC, um, Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Kevin Sowers um, to use sedamite, but in this time, that this case, we, uh, we inoculated the sedamite with a, a microorganism that uh, was known to destroy PCB molecules. Uh, they were scaled up, multiplied, and we applied the, the microorganisms to the pellets prior to broadcasting them into the creek or this ditch. The idea being that the carbon will hold the, or kind of sequester the PCB molecules and the microorganisms will eat them up. Uh, and we'll actually get some mass reduction. Uh, we did this project, uh, I want to say, four years ago now, and we we just uh, I think I think UMBC is evaluating the last set of data that we're going to collect uh, through this pilot study. So we'll do another presentation on that uh, for you all another time. Um, but the the initial results are that uh, it's it's actually working uh, the way we wanted to. We can't go full scale at this point because again, this is right in the middle of. Uh, this highly contaminated area. We still need to take care of some other sources, but this represents another tool in our remediation toolbox uh, that we can use when it comes time to actually get in the water once those sources are kind of turned off and we can focus on those secondary sources and, and really providing that uh, reduction that we need to uh, result in fish tissue reductions and water quality improvements. So a few other things. Um, it looks like, do, do I have a few minutes or are we done? Uh, on time. Joel, I did. All right. Yeah, you have, you have about 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. You know, that's perfect. Um, I'm sorry if this has been real fast. I had like 50 some odd slides to get through and I'm almost done, but I'm glad we have time. Uh, I want to talk about some of these other activities that our WATAR program is involved with. And it all really relates to the same thing. Uh, we're working with, uh, with some nonprofits looking at White Clay Creek dam and Brandywine dam sediments. Um, there's a big push to remove dams in these creeks to allow fish passage uh, by the American shad and some of the other species of concern in the area. And we wanted to make sure that any uh, repository of sediments that were trapped behind those dams uh, were not going to cause impacts to surface water quality or, or the ecological quality in these rivers. We, in both cases, we have drinking water intakes downstream of a lot of these dams. Uh, so we did, we completed the brandy wine and we're in the process of, of working on the white clay. Um, again, we're, we're working with EPA right now on an advanced restoration plan based upon this WATAR program, um, which for some of our waters would replace the need to develop a TMDL, um, but instead, you know, develop a restoration plan uh, and a list of actions that we can continue to work on to show improvements. Uh, we're working right now to completely revamp our Delaware dredging framework uh, and make sure that uh, the requirements we have for monitoring, uh, pre-assessment and disposal, beneficial reuse, all of that uh, is going to benefit the estuary and the river as opposed to be a detriment. So that's something we're in the process of working on. And of course, we can't get away from PFAS and the WATAR program is uh, involved with PFAS and fish, and we just completed a statewide uh, synoptic sampling of PFAS in surface water. Uh, for us, that was about 90 locations. But I want to talk real briefly about this Christina and Brandywine River Remediation, Restoration, and Resilience Project, uh, which we refer to as CBR4. Um, this gets right back to the same area I focused on in this entire presentation. Here's the Delaware River on the right. Uh, here is our tidal Christina River, and this little shoot over here is the tidal Brandywine River. That is the CBR4 project area. It is the area that had the highest sediment and fish impacts um, that we did through our synoptic sampling. Uh, so we went about uh, trying to develop a feasibility study for sediment remediation, uh, knowing that now is not the time, but while we're controlling additional uh, sources, we said now's a good time to develop that plan. Uh, so we're a couple years into that. Um, this is a seven mile stretch of the main stem river, uh, over 2000 acres. Um, the remediation portion of this show, uh, you know, I've, I've said this already, but you know, we have all these land-based sources we're still working on. We know, uh, or we're not naive enough to know that once we do that, that everything's gonna be clean. Uh, we know we have to focus on the sediments as well. Um, so, as I mentioned, we're working on this as we 
uh, complete some of some of the source uh, control efforts, which will take a few more years. Um, but we want to really have this plan. We want to know what it's going to cost, and we're going to need some time to come up with the money uh, probably to do this, uh, which again is why we're doing it now. We've hired a local consulting firm as well as Anchor QEA, who have partnered on this to help us with the, the remediation feasibility study portion of this. Uh, Dr. Ghosh is involved in this project as well, which we're thrilled about. Uh, so stay tuned on that. We're another year or two away from having that completed, uh, but we're working hard on it. Uh, from a restoration and resilience standpoint, you know, we've always been of the thought that, you know, if we're going to do a restoration project or, or a remediation project, you know, we can really save a lot of money and, and, you know, work together on things and our resources go a lot further. We can kind of leverage different sources of money if we do it together. So this is one of the aspects of this remediation that we're going to focus on. Uh, and that's incorporating restoration and resilience in, into the project as a whole. And uh, our Christina Conservancy, which is a nonprofit uh, in American Rivers, uh, later on in the process, they received a NIFWIF grant back in 2021, along with Denrex Assistance, uh, to develop a plan for incorporating restoration and resilience measures into this CBR4 project. Um, we've been working for two years as a large team on this. We have a ton of of partners at this point, um, from the municipalities to developers to nonprofits to the state, uh, we're, we're all involved. I think there are four uh, four Denrec programs involved in this initiative right now, including our parks folks, um, to to help us with some public access. Uh, but at the end, we've we've developed a plan and identified where good restoration projects could be in this area. Uh, we actually have a symposium or workshop going on tomorrow to uh, present all of the results of this, this two-year effort to the stakeholders. So we're really excited for that. Um, and then, you know, Denrex Watar team and our coastal programs uh, have kind of combined to and agreed that we're going to make sure that this all goes forward and that, uh, you know, over the course of the next decade or so, as we complete some source removals and, and we know what we need to do in the river that we can keep everything moving forward to try to get to that goal of fishable, swimmable, and potable in the shortest time frame possible. So the last couple slides I have just show that some of the efforts we've been taking on again are, are showing something in the fish. Uh, Walnut Street here is, is in the middle of the Christina River. Uh, and then we have a sample here from the Tidal Brandywine, both within that CBR4 project area, but you can see that uh, these last data points between I'd say 2007 and our 2015 sampling have, have dropped dramatically. Uh, I just received data uh, from our 2020 sampling and I have not added it and I haven't even looked to see what the data shows, but my hope is that we're at least consistent uh, or, or, or it continues to go down. Time will tell on that. Um, Again, that'll be for the next presentation. But up to this point, we're definitely showing some improvements uh, in the fish quality, uh, which makes us feel pretty good about what we're doing. Now, I took one of those plots uh, and, and overlaid here where the PCB TMDL was established for the, the Delaware River, which includes these tidal portions of the Christina. That was around 2003. And our WATAR program really started going in 2009. It took off really in 2012. Um, but when you throw those two things on there, you know, I'd like to say that all of these combined efforts between DRBC, EPA, DENREC, our communities, our municipalities, all of the things that I've talked about today are having a cumulative positive impact. The message is very clear, said it many times today. We still have a long way to go, uh, which, you know, makes me feel good about the, the remainder of my career. <laughs> uh, we'll still have some work to do. So last but not least, I will say that American Rivers named the Delaware River, uh, the river of the year in 2020. Um, this last little piece of information on here, again, says it all. We know there's more work to do, but you know what, we're really well on our way. Uh, here's some contact information for myself, uh, my co-manager of the WATAR program. Again, I'm in our watershed assessment section, which is Clean Water Act program. Uh, Todd is in our, our uh, remediation section within the Division of Waste and Hazardous Substances, which is a circular recra based program. And we've also recently brought in uh, Gordon Woodrow from our Division of Water, who manages a lot of the permitting programs, the NIPTES and the MS4 programs, as we're starting to get them involved a whole lot more. I've given a uh, 
a link here at the bottom to our uh, WATAR webpage, highlights some of the different projects that we've done. Um, again, has some of our additional contact information. And with that, I think I am done and I'll be happy to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you again for the opportunity. Well, thank you, John, that was fantastic. I think Delaware is clearly in the running for the coolest PCB stuff per square mile, per population, per capita, or even in an absolute sense. It's really, really cool to see all the stuff you guys are doing. Thank um, you. Before we take questions, I just wanted to continue to praise Delaware and say, we have to say the name Greg Cavella. Greg yes. was a longtime leader on the science program at the, the RPC. I remember a long, long time ago, 25 years ago, Greg pounding on the table saying, we must use better analytical methods. We must use these new techniques. And he was a lone voice. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of resistance, know, a lot yeah. of like, oh, this is too hard. This is too expensive. We, you know, what do we ever do? And I think we are, you know, the data we saw yesterday and the day we saw today is a direct result of Greg. And others. Uh, I'll tell you um, that half of the slides at the beginning of my presentation came from one of Greg's presentations a few years ago. <laughs> I, I, I recognize those slides. Yes. <laughs> so it shows what, you know, individuals make a big difference, right? Um, and That's right. So I, so I just wanted to, to recognize Greg uh, for that. And I know that he was involved in the, in the Spokane River as a consultant there. later on trying to, you know, same shoe beating on the same table, different table saying, you got to get good data. You got to get good data. So, so there we are. Um, we have a few minutes for questions before our break, and um, I am, well, I have one, then maybe we can have um, Mario or others, Andy, if you want to chime in here, but I'm wondering, the Amtrak thing is an interesting one, right, because that's obviously there was a real PCB hotspot related to the yeah. railway operations. I'm wondering how common that is around the country or are other people seeing um, hot, you know, PCB hotspots related to, and I, I believe those are like switching yards or I don't know the exact. Well, the, the, the Amtrak sites, we, yeah, we have in Delaware, the two sites at the top of, the, of our list are, are maintenance facilities. Well, one was a former refueling facility and one is an active maintenance facility. Uh, the other one is more of a siding, you know, along I-95, but still has a lot of issues adjacent to a marsh. Yes, I'm just thinking here on the West Coast, there's railroad lines right along the shoreline all the way up and down the coast. And just, and, you know, not, not so much the maintenance yard, but just, I'm just wondering for the others on the in, at the workshop, just thinking about, you know, how important um, what we're looking for these, these diffuse sources, how important these rail operations are around the country. Um, well, interestingly, DR, that well, the, the one site, uh, the Amtrak site um, exceeded the TMDL for the Delaware River in Zone Five by itself every day uh, for the longest time. Now they they instituted a lot of uh, minimization measures and that has decreased, um, but I'm you know they're still discharging. Uh, it, it, it you can't get away from it. And this this remediation program that we've got lined up, I, I I'm really looking forward to seeing it happen. Um, a lot of innovative techniques are going to be used in that entire site. This is all being done through Tosca as well. Tosca compliant. The concentrations are certainly that high. Um, you know, the entire site will end up with a, a recro style cap uh, after removal of the highest concentrations of PCBs and an entire rerouting of drainage systems and the in-situ stabilization of a former uh, drainage pond that that I want to say has Hudson River Val uh, kind of levels of PCBs detected in them. Um, real high concentrations. Yeah. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about, you've done some really good work and your group has done really good work on both the active sort of mass removal type remediation and then also coming back and doing the in-situ work with the, with the activated carbon and the other types of media. Um, where do you feel that is? I mean, is that is that a fairly mature technology now or is it still an R&D effort? Or how, how do you guys view the in-situ work? Uh, well, I Personally, I view it as, like I said, a tool in our toolbox. You know, we did our first project with Dr. Ghosh uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, and, and I've continued to monitor that water body, and it's it's been a success. Um, the second application we did, again, seems to have been successful. Um, it, certainly, my, my viewpoint of the in-situ uh, treatment technologies is that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, it's really a good polishing technique where we're looking at concentrations, uh, you know, in the hundreds of parts per billion, uh, you know, not not in the part per million range necessarily. So it's um, I certainly think it could work uh, if you dose it enough. Um, 
but but that might be a better question for Dr. Coach to answer. <laughs> uh, I think it's getting a lot more popular. Uh, that's for sure. The carbon-based technologies, and and we certainly aren't the, the only place to have done it now. Um, I haven't heard one yet that's failed. Yeah, and if you ask him, he's he's going to tell you it works. But and, I, and it does work. I just it, it seems like that's almost a you know so the obvious place where we're moving we're moving with this was the the active mass removal is not going to get us where we need to go. So there's always going to have to be some sort of in situ capping, polishing, you know, whatever term you want to use for it. So it's, it's as you say, it's, it's it's a sequence of remediation um, tools that you need to use use on these sites. Now, is there anything in the chat that my, my colleague has been answering a lot of questions, Todd Kaiser, in the chat? Um, are there any that are that are pressing right now, or can we get back to them later? You know, I love the dynamic of having our speakers and then having their wingmen answer the questions in the chat. That seems like that works out pretty well. And maybe we just ask Todd if he's, are you seeing anything unresolved there? He did knock off a bunch of the questions and, and others as well. <laughs> Ooh, I'm yeah. unmuted. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there was a question early on about, I believe, PCB concentrations in uh, surface water in the Delaware Bay that I wasn't able to locate a number. I don't know if we had a reference for that, John. Uh, I'll have to look it up. Um, okay. I'm I'm not good at pulling concentrations out, out of my head. Uh, we look at so much every day, but uh, this afternoon I will I'll try to find a surface water sample. I did actually for this presentation look at some surface water data. Uh, I chose not to put it in there because again it it didn't necessarily show massive improvements. We have concentrations up and down. Uh, it's a tidal system. It's sloshing back and forth every day. Um, it didn't show anything beneficial, <laughs> but I'll look at the magnitude of the concentration and put it in the chat in a little while. And then, um, Joel, I think another one that just got asked by by Jeff Stern is, you know, how is Delaware focused its work today and how you think it will change going forward? And John, you've done such a wonderful job. Could you answer this one, too? <laughs> how are we going to refocus? <laughs> um, well, can, can I say PFAS? Um, Please don't. But yes, yeah, do. I'd rather not. We, we, we listen for, for us at PFAS. We're trying to look at it in the same way. It's another contaminant. Uh, it has sources um, that were really all about source mitigation, source control. Um, so, I, you know, I'd say more of the same. Um, you know, we know we're not done with our top 10 list. You know, we can certainly knock that down to what I say about 22 sites. Um, but there's still going to be 10 of those that that are higher than the other 10. So I think we'll just shift priorities in, in that regard to what the next top 10 list is. Uh, you know, we're already working with our MS4 group. Um, actually, there's been a regional meeting uh, on trying to develop uh, implementation strategies uh, for MS4s within the, the TMDL. And, and, you know, Delaware's part of that. Um, we've done some work already, as I mentioned today, with with those jurisdictions. I think some additional effort. Uh, you know, we've put a lot of effort in the past decade or so on holistic characterization of the problem, and then focusing on those waste sites. I think now we, it's time to push a little harder, I guess, maybe uh, into some of the permitting sides of things, uh, and, and really work with those jurisdictions on you know, more regular monitoring, more uh, actions or remedial actions, if you will, uh, to reduce the concentrations. Uh, you know, we're, we're a small state here in Delaware. Uh, Todd and I are pretty much the WATAR program, and we pull resources from everywhere else across the department as we need to uh, and, and as we can. Um, so, you know, continued expansion for us throughout the department uh, is, is certainly on the table. Um, but working with those, per, you know, more with the permitted um, side of things and, and some of those point sources, uh, and I guess the the, the MS4 non-point source runoff stuff is is where we need to go next. Great, thanks for that. Any other pressing questions? We're bumping up against a break time here. Marielle, are we are we good? I think we are good and we will plan to reconvene back at 1130. So I guess folks, 10 minutes um, for our next presentation. All right. I want to thank the speakers. That was, that was fabulous. Good stuff. Awesome. See thank you, you very much. And with that, I can hand it back to Greg to kick us off. All right. Thank you. So uh, I get the privilege of introducing our next speaker. Um, first, a shout out to Natalie Burgo, 
Natalie is in EPA Region 1 in the Superfund program, and she is one of the leads for the New Bedford Harbor site. And we just want to acknowledge her contribution to improving conditions at the site and in the harbor. Uh, but uh, fortunately, we have David Dickerson with us today to represent the team. Dave grew up on the shores of Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island and received his BS in environmental engineering from Syracuse University. He's worked in a research lab and in consulting, but most of his career has been at EPA Region 1 in Boston, managing the cleanups of large and complex Superfund sites. While at EPA, he's also worked in the Regional Clean Water Act Enforcement Office, as well as contributed to the Smart Growth and Browns, Brownfields programs. For many years, he's been a senior project manager for the New Bedford Harbor Superfund site, with the current final phase being the remediation and restoration of five miles of PCB contaminated shorelines and salt marshes. Outside of EPA, he has served for over 20 years as the president of the L Pond Improvement Council in Melrose, Massachusetts and also as a board member at the Savin Hill Yacht Club in Dorchester, Massachusetts. That sounds really nice. Uh, so that's uh, David Dickerson. Really glad to have you today, Dave. It's all yours. Thank you, Greg. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen and we'll get going. Are you seeing the New Bedford Harbor screen? Not at the moment, but it should yeah. be share screen, select the screen and the bottom right, there's kind of a button to confirm. There we go. How's that look? That's it. Awesome, miracles do happen. Yeah, so um, thanks for the opportunity to tell the New Bedford Harbor story. Um, I guess first as a prelude, just uh, let me see how say how impressed I was with all the previous presentations and uh, all the great science and engineering and policy that's being brought to bear on these thorny issues and uh, the wide variety of roles and uh, <clears throat> perspectives that we all have. Um, I am going to bring maybe a little different perspective because this is a story about straight up Superfund cleanup of a very egregiously contaminated, PCB contaminated harbor. Um, so um, maybe a little bit more engineering and remediation than science, but um, a lot of good lessons learned that I'll try and share. Anyway, so just make sure we, everyone knows where we are. This is uh, the New Bedford Harbor area down here, about an hour south of Boston, less than an hour from Cape Cod, very popular tourist area. Um, can you all see my cursor? Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah. This is the mighty Krishnit River coming in from the north. Um, you'll hear me talk about the terms upper harbor and lower harbor. Upper Harbor is north of 195. Whoops, sorry about that. Lower Harbor is south of 95, 195. Uh, and then Buzzers Bay is, is out here. It's about an 18,000 acre site. 1,000 acres are north of the hurricane barrier built in the 60s by the Corps of Engineers. Um, two facilities, two capacitor manufacturing facilities caused all the damage, but the lion's share by far is up here at the Airbox site, um, as well as further south at Cornell Dubalier site. Uh, just to kind of uh, give you a feel of what I'm talking about, this is the upper harbor. Uh, that's the New Bedford shoreline on the opposite side of the Cushnet River. Lots of brick and mortar old textile mills, some of which are still commercial industrial, but many have been converted to residential. 
Interestingly, the city is planning to kind of squeeze a river walk here in between the mills and the, and the shore. On the other side is a completely different land use story, the big, land, big salt marsh and forested areas in a Krishnit and Fairhaven mass. Lower Harbor is, is a uh, home to a large offshore fishing fleet, um, which kind of makes our messaging, we have to be very careful with our messaging about local seafood consumption. Obviously these commercial fishing boats go hundreds of miles offshore. Um, diving in a little bit closer, this shows a inset of the Airvox facility. Um, in hindsight, the property and the building should have been included in the Superfund site, but it wasn't. And we've had to kind of cobble together, uh, working with the state and the city, a cleanup program for that property. The building was demolished in 2012 saturated with PCBs inside um, and it was vacant at that time and the upland cleanup uh, was just finished in the last couple of years per the state's 21e hazardous waste program um, covering a lot of material real quick here but uh, this is kind of the 30,000 foot view the sediment PCB levels prior to dredging Look at the look at the units. This is greater than four thousand parts per million uh, in red, decreasing north to south. I should say um, it is a tidal embayment, four foot tides twice a day, so we do get contamination kind of sloshing northward as well as south. Um, a little pocket of contamination down here offshore Cornell Dubalier. Seems like this little cove created by the hurricane barrier is a depositional area where we've got minor amounts of, from a New Bedford perspective anyways, minor amounts of PCB contamination there. Um, this was an early identified kind of mega site, if I can use that term, in 1979. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health issued regulations um, <clears throat> regarding consumption of, of seafood, uh, covering 18,000 acres. I'm not going to belabor all the, the details here, but everything north of the hurricane barrier was, was uh, not allowed to consume. So we continue uh, make, getting this message out, even though, as we'll talk about today, we're, we're almost done with the remedy 40 years later. Um, <laughs> but it's still not safe to eat. So it's a message you have to make early and often. We do trilingual English, Spanish, and there's a high Portuguese population as well. Um, threw in some tissue data. Um, these are all collected by the state. Um, generally kind of noisy. Alewife looks like it's decreasing. Nicely, scup not so much. Uh, sometimes the area three in red, which is the outer harbor, uh, is equal or greater than area two. So the scup are obviously moving around. Uh, quahogs or shellfish, hard shell clam, very kind of culturally important in the area. They show a nice, nicer trend because they're stationary. These are all area two samples. I had to throw this one in uh, just because, I mean, look at the units. These are parts per million. <laughs> uh, don't eat the eel. That's all I'm going to say about that. Although I have had eel, it's very tasty. Um, moving the clock forward to 1998, um, when the record of decision was issued, um, since then, about a million cubic yards of subtitle dredging below the low tide line has been, has been removed and completed in 2020. Most of that's gone off site to a Tosca landfill by rail to Michigan, which is why it's so expensive. But as we talked about, a lot of it went to a CAD cell as well. Uh, about five miles of shoreline remediation and restoration, and that's, that's where we are now. 
hope to finish that over the next couple of years. Target cleanup levels really depend on land use and harbor area. The rod makes it clear that we really would have preferred to go to one part per million everywhere, uh, especially in the upper harbor, but it would have had a, um, we've had to dug up a lot more of that, that beautiful fault marsh system on the east shore. Um, so we walked away from that a little bit. Um, about a billion dollars in total direct and indirect costs. The indirect costs are the, the agency costs associated with supporting the Superfund program. And those are, those are uh, very significant, about uh, I think it's 25 or 30% now. And about 50% of that billion is from cash out settlement. So um, yes, it's a lot of money, but we, we had done pretty well on the settlement front. Last but not least in yellow is what we call a state enhanced remedy for navigational dredging. State enhanced remedy is kind of this niche aspect of circle of that allows the state to on their dime enhance the Superfund remedy um, and so the state requested that uh, navigational dredging be included as a state enhanced remedy in the OU1 rod. Um, and we said yes, navigational dredging and disposal, I should say, importantly, uh, as long as it doesn't uh, interfere with the Superfund remedy, which it hasn't. Um, thankfully, all of the navigational areas are lower in PCP levels than the Superfund action level, so there really wasn't any overlap with that. But that's also, uh, we'll be doing about a million cubic yards of dredging. And in New Bedford Harbor, the navigational dredging does have a, a remedial aspect to it. So um, making a long story short, the rod was issued. We diligently proceeded with setting up this big, humongous dredging and disposal effort, lots of infrastructure. Call, the, call this the four Ds of hydraulic dredging. We have a cutter head dredge up to number one, to sanding operation number two, dewatering number three. Doesn't even show the water treatment aspect. Once you squeeze the water out of the sediments, it's just to, had to treat it to very low levels. Clean Water Act doesn't allow discharges into a non attainment water body. So copper and PCBs are above the criteria, so we had to treat down to the criteria for both of those, the water quality criteria. And last but not least, for its disposal is a, that's a lined rail car being loaded up. Um, it occurred to me after I made this slide that there's another D and, and really kind of an important one. I don't know if there's any dredging folks that might want to hazard a guess as to what that might be, but it is debris disposal. And that can be a very messy operation, both in terms of turbidity and believe it or not, air quality. I was working on a site in Western Mass, a similar type of project, GE Pittsfield and the Housatonic River. We were capping Silver Lake, about a 30 acre lake. And uh, first I had to pull out all the old cars and whatnot that were in the mud and pulling them out this full, covered with this oily, you know, substance and the air monitors started pinging. So debris removal is not trivial. The reason I'm telling you all this is, well, let me, let me go a little bit more. These are overhead photos of all this infrastructure, the descending facility, upper left, we had the least this city property, um, the dewatering facility. This is about a $30 million facility. There was nothing there. We had to build it all. We worked with the city to site it. We had to relocate four water dependent businesses, not a trivial undertaking. Um, but we worked with the city and the mayor and the department heads to have them redevelop the derelict rail yard that was across the street. So we knew going off site by rail was the cheaper way to go as opposed to trucking. So we uh, spent a lot of time and energy to get these facilities built. Over here shows you where they are. This is air box up here and the sanding facility watering. So by about the 2004 timeframe, we had all these facilities up, uh, but then we ran out of money and headquarters would only give us $15 million a year. Now, that's a lot of money, but for a mega site like this, doesn't really go, did not really go that far in these 
these nice facilities that we built lay unused for eight months a year. So that wasn't a great outcome. And another long story short, because of that, we added a 300,000 cubic yard CAD cell to the Superfund remedy. If you don't know what a CAD cell, I'll be talking about that next. Uh, but uh, they are large excavations in the harbor bottom to manage contaminated sediments. Um, used a lot in the Northeast for contaminated navigational sediments. And what I'm showing here in red are the, the navigational CAD cells. This is CAD cell four that's in the construction now. This is the Superfund CAD cell, Lower Harbor CAD cell. Um, and really, I think had um, New Bedford Harbor not had these navigational CAD cells, we would have been hard pressed to, to sell a super fun CAD cell. But um, the Harbor community was, was used to CAD cells. We, we took the opportunity to do a lot of monitoring of the CAD cells to support a super fun CAD cell. We only put the lower level type material in the super fun CAD cell. Um, and um, this worked out quite well, saved us a ton of money and time. Also on this slide shows all the additional navigational dredging in blue that it is above and beyond the Superfund dredging. Uh, this is kind of a simple illustrative chart that we showed, put together to you know, educate the public as to what a, a CAD cell is. And basically you're stripping off the top layer of contaminated silts, managing those separately. Ideally, there's a CAD cell that had been not filled up previously and you put these organic silts in that CAD cell. Once you get past the first couple of feet though, you get into this squeaky clean glacial till in New Bedford Harbor that glaciers left 15,000 years ago. And that um, can be used beneficially or after it gets tested can um, go to an offshore disposal facility. Um, showing here the contaminated material getting placed. Um, and after a period of consolidation and only after a period of consolidation can you put the sand slash TOC cap on. Um, the consolidation period is important to develop some compressive strength in the contaminated sediment so that it will support the sand cap. Uh, interestingly, the agency did perform a pilot CAD cell in the late 80s, early 90s time frame. Uh, but at that time, the importance of the consolidation phase really, I guess, wasn't well understood. And the cap just kind of trickled through the contaminated material and was deemed to be not successful. And uh, in hindsight, I, I wish we had, we, the agency, I wish the agency had learned the lesson, take advantage of that lesson learned and said, uh, you know, CAD cells could have worked and we could have included it in the rod at the outset instead of changing, changing the rod, whatever, uh, 13 years later. Typically the surface is a bowl shaped, so you get additional deposition on top of that. Um, but we feel very confident these will be the cleanest parts of the harbor when all is said and done. To give you a sense, the, the Superfund CAD cell, the lower harbor CAD cell is 55 feet deep. So these are, these are big engineering features. I think the next photo is of a split hole scow, placing material into the CAD cell. I don't think these operators appreciated getting their picture taken, but anyways. This figure just shows those areas uh, of the harbor that were placed into the CAD. So disregard the color coding between the blue and the yellow. Those are just different contracts. Um, interesting, interestingly, even though the CAD cell is a little over 300,000 yards, we were able to put 388,000 yards into it because of that consolidation, 388,000 in situ yards. And so we were able to, to um, go a little bit into the upper harbor here and place these materials 
into the CAD cell as well. I'm not going to belabor all these numbers. This was put together for a different audience, but it just shows how much less expensive it is to go with CAD cell. $166 a cubic yard when you include the uh, construction costs, as opposed to us in the bedroom, $500 plus for hydraulic dredging and offsite uh, T and D to a Tosca landfill in Michigan. It really wasn't so much the savings in money. Of course, that's, that's real money, but uh, we were able to do that much more cleanup faster. Uh, this slide just shows some interesting uh, interactions between CAD cells and the beneficial reuse of the bottom of CAD material. Uh, in the foreground, you're seeing North Terminal under construction. This is going to be uh, the very robust industrial strength facility to support the offshore wind, the nascent offshore wind industry in New Bedford. Um, the middle ground here is the lower harbor CAD cell surrounded by its silk curtain. Then the back is the CAD cell four under construction. You can see the excavator on the barge here. But what's happening is this scow is full of the sand and gravel that came from the bottom of CAD cell four. And it's a beautiful structural fill material that's being used to fill in these cellular coffer dams. We call them the coffee cans. Um, once they're done with that, they're also going to use the bottom of CAD sand and gravel to cap the Superfund CAD cell, the Lower Harbor CAD cell. Um, so some really great examples of beneficial reuse of that, that natural resource. Cleanup status now, happy to report, we're, we're around the clubhouse turn, uh, it's probably 98% complete by volume now. Only these pink shoreline areas need to be remediated. Oops, sorry about that. Need to be remediated. Um, the green is everything that was dredged. Um, the blue is areas in shoreline areas that have been remediated. As I mentioned, the pink are the remaining areas. The red areas are areas that we've had to do sediment caps. Um, variety of reasons that sometimes dredging doesn't make sense right next to a bridge embankment, for example, right next to a pilot CDF, for example. Uh, some places had lots of debris, wires and, and telephone poles and whatnot that uh, just made dredging impractical. We also have a very beefy high TOC sand cap in front of the Aerobox site. And uh, so far that's been testing out great. We use the PED polyethylene device samples, uh, both before and after capping. Um, it shows no detects after capping. We're also doing it before and after the state remediation of Aerobox uh, to make sure that um, if we do find any, or to, to see if, if there's impact from that state cleanup on, on the air box cap. Um, so it's really all, all tools in the toolbox. It's kind of the message when it comes to sediment remediation. Uh, here's just a picture of what we call East Zone 2, the upper harbor underway. That's what we're working on now. It's a pretty intensive effort to get all the construction mats out there to make the uh, the roadways that the heavy equipment can travel on. Uh, we have a nice amphibious excavator here that uh, has been very useful. Obviously, after we remove all the contaminated material, we have to bring in clean backfill and do a lot of planting, tens of thousands of, of Spartina, etc. plants. Uh, real quick, this is a slide we presented to the public just to give you a sense of some of the levels that we deal with in New Bedford. This is right across from Aerovox in this little 
cove. So it was really a, uh, a magnet for PCBs, if you will. Before excavation, 1,400 parts per million, maximum of 21,000 parts per million. Uh, after excavation, these middle numbers are the floor of the excavation prior to backfill, at least one foot minimum of, of excavation. Um, so that, that, that's pretty good right off the bat, but then the clean backfill that we bring in, we test and it non detects. So all in all, you're looking at six or seven orders of magnitude of reduction. So that's, that's something we feel pretty good about. Uh, this is that East Zone 1 area. All of this area in black was excavated and backfilled and salt marsh reconstructed. And for every area, we have a five-year monitoring and the maintenance program to make sure that uh, our rebuilt salt marshes uh, stand the test of time, so to speak. Uh, we've learned the hard way that it's not a slam dunk, that once you plant the salt marsh, that it's going to stay planted. So we've developed this mapping protocol of mapping sparse vegetation along the, what we're seeing here is along the edge, it's not that. Um, much of a surprise. Uh, invasive species, Phragmites in yellow, purple loosestrife. Uh, we treat for invasive species every year, but it's going to be a challenge. Interestingly, this prior to remediation, this whole area was Phragmites. So um, we're happy that we've got a little bit more diverse habitat there. Also mapping some erosional areas. These are just small areas that uh, not 911, so to speak, but we want to keep a keep a look on that at that. Um, kind of a common theme uh, in the presentations is long-term monitoring to look at remedy effectiveness. Uh, this is a program that our colleagues at uh, EPA Narragansett Lab in Rhode Island helped put together covers all 18,000 acres. Um, each of these polygons is a sample site. Um, sediment chemistry and sediment physical properties like TOC and grain size, benthic organism counts uh, to look at the biodiversity of the benthic environment. Um, and this is something we do every five years or so or after significant milestones. Um, you know, we don't want to spend a billion dollars and not really know if we, we solved the problem. This, this is just looking at ecological quality of the benthic environment. It doesn't look at seafood and risk to human health. That's a separate issue being monitored by the state. But uh, just wanted to make the point that we, this is a whole uh, presentation on its own. So I'm Apologize, I'm covering a lot of ground here. Um, some lessons learned. Uh, number one, seek second opinion for major decisions. Um, I remember clearly when I was first given the baton to take over to bed for back in the 90s. And, uh, you know, the agency didn't frankly have a lot of sediment remediation experience. And there's this one consultant we had lot, relied upon. And, Came up to me one day very seriously and said, "You know, Dave, you want to you want to clean up your bed for Harbor. You got to go with CDFs." And at that time, we had uh, a proposed plan on the streets, uh, proposing four shoreline CDFs for uh, disposal and isolation, sequestration of about half a million cubic yards. And at the end of the day, we didn't build any of them. <laughs> I laugh just because um, it's just a striking example of how you need to stay open-minded and, and seek second opinions. Um, as, we, as we started into the CDF construction and engineering process, we, we had a lot of problems with foundation issues, and, uh, a lot of problems with implementation issues with CDF remaining open for many years if we didn't have funding and the offsite disposal costs were coming down. Um, so we ultimately, as I mentioned, went, went offsite um, 
to a Tosca landfill uh, for about, um, what is that, two thirds or so of the, of the material, the, of the contaminated sediments. Uh, number two is kind of obvious probably for this crowd, don't skimp on sample density, but within our, our team, we work with the Corps of Engineers a lot. Um, there's still people who say, oh, that's gonna cost money to do more sampling. Well, guess what? It's a lot more money to do more remediation than you have to, uh, or if you have to make a change midway because you didn't have enough characterization. Uh, so that, that's a really important lesson for, for these types of sites. Number three, it looks like, oh, sorry about the typo. Ultimately, we went with congener analyses. Uh, we were all over the place uh, over the years, but um, landing on congener analyses is the, is the best way to go. We did pair them with immunoassay screening to um, allow a, a tighter sampling density and keep some costs down, but the ultimate um, defining of the dredge prisms or the excavation uh, areas was done by congener. Um, number four is also obvious early and often engagement with stakeholders, but can't emphasize it enough. Uh, for example, we have hundreds of access agreements with the property owners up and down the river. Um, and you really needed to create relationships with all of them. Uh, not just for sampling, but for getting the, you know, the, the heavy yellow equipment for remediation onto their land. And by and large, most people were great to work with, but uh, some of them were not so great to work with. Um, some of the stake other stakeholders, we work with the state DEP a lot. They pay 10%. Um, and they also will um, handle O&M. Uh, once we're done with remediation. Um, and they, as I have mentioned, do the seafood monitoring. Uh, also work very closely with the city staff in New Bedford um, and really pay, uh, pays off to develop these, these positive relationships with folks. Cause you know, you might find yourself in a public meeting getting yelled at by some member of the public and you'll get people to, to stand up for you. Um, number five, be open to change. Adaptive management is the buzzword. Um, you know, the CAD self story that I just went through is a perfect example. Uh, we, we had a great plan with our dredging and offsite disposal approach, but we ran out of money and weren't getting adequately funded from headquarters. So we, um, you know, we tacked and went to CAD cell instead and it, and it worked out great. Uh, and as I've mentioned, number six include monitoring of remedy effectiveness over the long term. So uh, that's kind of the quick and dirty of New Bedford Harbor. I obviously way under my time, but um happy to answer any questions. I haven't been monitoring chat. I don't know if there are any chat questions around <clears throat> that need to be answered. Can anyone hear me? Yes, yes, David. Hey, so uh, an amazing story. Just amazing. Um, congratulations, you guys that are on the front line here and for what you've accomplished. Awesome. Uh, Thanks, so, yeah, and looking in chat, I'm not seeing a lot. Uh, I did put in a question. It, it It's kind of a dizzying to think of all the coordination that had to go into a army of contractors that got this done. And I'm just, was that EPA? Was this a fun lead site where EPA did all of that coordinating? Um, it's a great question. The, the org chart from Bedford Harbor, unfortunately it's a little dysfunctional, but um, 
that's kind of the biggest challenge of our day to day because we send all of our millions of dollars to the Corps of Engineers. And it's the Corps contracts and the Corps contractors hmm. that implement with, with EPA oversight, very close oversight. So it's kind of a, a tag team with, uh, with the EPA and the Corps of Engineers. But do um, hmm. you know what I mean? It can get a little dicey because it's not, it's not our contracts. So hmm. it, it's really a lesson in teamwork and getting everything ironed out in advance. Mm. Uh, the core, to their credit, has put together these cost plus contracts, uh, the pros and cons, but the, um, what that means is the contracts are more easily amended in, in the field, in the middle of the work. Um, but they are very expensive as, as the con. Mm -hmm. um, how do these CAD cells hold up over time? I'm seeing um, <clears throat> so far, so good. Um, we did a ton of modeling using the Corps of Engineers Center of Expertise um, and showed very, very positive results. As I mentioned, we did a lot of monitoring of, of CAD cells. That's a whole other presentation. But I guess that's really not a question of holding up over time. I see a chat question here. Navigational training is not covered as part of remediation. Uh, that's the whole thing I tried to describe with the SER, the State Enhanced Remedy. It's kind of this little known part of CERCLA that allows the uh, state to enhance a remedy on the state's dime. And the advantage to the state is that they get the advantage of the, the streamlined permitting of CERCLA. Um, <clears throat> so, and then a highly contaminated harbor like New Bedford, the, the navigational dredging does have a cleanup aspect to it. Because even though those navigational areas are below PCB levels that Superfund would go after, they're, they're, still, they're still pretty high. How do you monitor the CAD cells? Um, another chat question. Um, it just kind of like you'd monitor a, a sediment cap over a contaminated area that's not a CAD cell. Uh, a lot of bathymetry to make sure it's staying where you want it. A lot of chemistry, make sure there's not uh, the elevated results might want to do some PED, you know, month long polyethylene device studies as well to look at pore water. Uh, benthic enumeration on top of the CAD cells would be another, another approach. Um, so, as I mentioned, we were very fortunate that the navigational state enhanced remedy program had done four of these CAD cells already. So, the harbor community there was um, used to them, so to speak, and uh, embraced the concept. But I don't think you could sell a cat cell in it in, in a lot of other areas. It's just it doesn't feel like to the public. It doesn't doesn't I don't know. At first glance, they'll say, "Oh, you're just you know sweeping it out of the rug." But no, the from a uh, you know the, the geotechnical and a, biological and sequestration standpoint, especially for PCBs, you know, uh, for other contaminants, contaminants that might not be the right approach. But for PCBs, it's the perfect approach. Um, the CAD cell cap, I should have mentioned, will have uh, a specified TOC content in it. Uh, in case you do have any upwelling dissolved PCBs, we don't really expect much if any, but in case there are, the TOC is in there to, to sequester those. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it sure does. And what's the depth of that sand once the cap is fully in place in one of those cells? Uh, it's a minimum three foot cap. Um, 
And as mentioned over time, we expect additional natural sediment deposition. Okay, so David, you mentioned the chemical analysis and the, the benthics profiling. Did, did you ever consider or uh, the need for the th third part of the toxics triad, uh, the toxicity uh, testing of the sediment itself? We have, yes. Yep. Some of the those long-term monitoring rounds have included sediment toxicity. There's a little bit noisy data. We haven't included it in all of our our long-term monitoring rounds, but um, but we will continue to consider it. That's an excellent excellent point. Mm. Okay, a little more coming in here. I guess you're seeing the questions uh, from Andy about in, engagement and related to that. I was wondering, is there a harbor keeper? In this engagement with stakeholders, was at some point is there a harbor keeper to be coordinating with? Not per se, no. I mean, there's um, the Buzzards Bay Coalition is a big nonprofit that's um, headquartered in Boston. They, to their credit, have been buying up a lot of the salt marsh and budding forested areas that I mentioned in the Upper Harbor on the east side. Uh, for long-term open space. Uh, and so really more, it's just the municipal conservation commissions and, and New Bedford does have a stewardship office that we work closely with. Um, in this photo that we're looking at off to the right, to the right of the big uh, smokestack, that's the Airlock State cleanup underway. You can see the excavator and the temporary sheet piling that they put in to remove all the, the shoreline soils. That's where the building used to be? Correct, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one more here from Will. Are there other coastal sites that use CAD cells? Um, we did a ton of research in this and we found a smaller CAD cell at a Navy facility on the West Coast. I can't remember the name of it now. That was really the only example. A lot of sites were considering them. Some had them on the books in the Raj, but hadn't implemented yet. Uh, the biggest use of CAD cells, as I mentioned, at least in the Northeast, is for contaminated navigational sediments. You know, the way the navigational program works, um, <clears throat> very rigorous testing to get to a so-called suitability determination, uh, meaning is the material clean enough, and it does include toxicity and biomagnification testing, is it squeaky clean enough to go to an offshore disposal site? And um, that's just not the case in all these New England old cities. There's so much legacy contamination. So CAD cells were, were kind of brought in as the, a technique that was practical and doable. Um, now, at some point, all of the areas that are amenable for CAD cells are going to go by, are going to get used up. And so there's going to be another challenge at some point. Um, uh, Naval site in Bremerton, Sinclair Inlet, used to CAD. Okay, good. Yeah, a few examples there of other CADs. Something tells me they didn't have the high levels that we had at New Bedford, but uh, nevertheless, it's good to have other examples. Hmm. Uh, and a question cool. from Amy about what are the most time intensive parts of the process? I have any thoughts on ways to move move through major roadblocks more quickly well that that is the billion dollar question isn't it um, um, stakeholder involvement is a big one um, don't skimp on sampling when you're doing the RIFS. You know, get out there and do as much sampling as possible. 
Uh, maybe look at presumptive remedies. Um, you know, we're developing nationally, I would say, um, kind of a track record for sediment caps that might make it easier to sell caps, sediment caps to the general public. Um, but unfortunately, it's the nature of the BCC. These big sites just seem to take forever. Uh, my colleague, Natalie Burgo is going to set the record though, right? She's, <laughs> she's a project manager for the newest PCB river site, the lower Neponsa River that discharges into Boston Harbor. So Natalie's going to show us how to do it, right, Natalie? <laughs> uh, yeah, these are some good suggestions too. Maybe think about early actions and hotspot. I didn't even talk about the hotspot remedy at New Bedford. That's a whole other presentation, but um, um, again, all tools in the toolbox. Um, don't exist in a bubble, do a lot of stakeholder coordination. I think we all have can come up with suggestions for that. I think CAD cells are fine for sea level rise. Uh, the, the work that the, the, the core did on modeling, um, we really, especially in New Bedford Harbor behind the hurricane barrier, we don't really expect wave energy to get down to a, a depth that's going, or an energy at depth that's going to negatively impact the CADs. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, what we'll have to do is after any big storm, go out there and do the bathymetry again and do a comparison. Add more cap, maybe armor it. We prefer not to armor it so that we keep the, the habitat value. But yeah, it's something to think about. Okay, Dave. Well, I think you've done a great job at answering the questions here in chat, and I'm not seeing any others. So thank you so much. This is a success story uh, that shows the full application of CERCLA authorities to deal with a really bad problem. And so it's very inspirational and uh, gives us all some hope. Uh, so I think it was a, a really great addition to our conference. So one more just trickled in here. Does the harbor freeze during the winter? Some of it does, yes. Not so much now, um, but the ice the, where the cat cell is, well, doesn't doesn't get ice, and it's a part of the industrial port area, so it's not going to build up. Okay, well, depending on how cold it is up there right now, that's a good thing right now. So, good question. Right. Yeah, th thanks again, Dave. Uh, excellent information. And uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, but not much. I think I'll turn it back over to other co facilitators here and we'll start to wrap up. And I think Andy is going to help us with that, either Andy or Will. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks everybody for the presentations today. Those are really, um, uh, really good. I really appreciated hearing about them. Um, we had a few things left that 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 we sort of want to wrap up with. Um, uh, Joel has put together some thoughts. I wanted to share. Uh, so that would be one thing. Um, Mario, we have another poll, um, sort of revisiting our objectives of this whole exercise, right? We had some stated objectives that we'd like to get your feedback on, uh, through a poll and then also kind of go over the, the, the poll results from yesterday and, and some potential next steps. Um, so, so run through that. I think we are ahead of time a little bit, but, um, there's never any harm in wrapping up early in these kind of things. So, um, Joel, if you're, if you're on and available, I'll just go ahead and, and advance the slides from my side here. Um, and then we can walk through those. And, and um, Mario, maybe after we get through through um, um, 
the sort of my part with the poll, then then you can deploy the the Zoom poll for today, sort of right at the end of this. So. Sounds good. Joel, just let me know and I'll advance advance as you want. So, thank you, Andy. Uh, advance on. So what I did here, I have a couple of slides that I think are more in the in the history or more or more in the in the genre of next steps or things we might do in the future, as opposed to summaries of what were presented. So these are my my thoughts for the day, rolling in some of the things for yesterday. So, um, and again, this is meant, this is meant to be first draft, um, food for thought, up for up for discussion. But the kinds of things I heard that we may do, and some of this is sort of work we can do between meetings, and some of this might be fodder for like the next time we get together. For those who want to get together again, this could be a focus of maybe the discussion. So. With that introduction, I'm the kinds of things I've heard, um, and some of this is out of the chat. Um, comparing the thresholds, I think just kind of getting um, all of the thresholds for impairment related to fish consumption, water quality, and sediments, um, and, and different approaches around the country, um, similar approaches around the country, but you know, results vary by place. So just kind of getting that all in one place, I think, would be useful just to the, in a comparative sense. Um, ditto with the analytical methods. I think we're sort of landing on um, or converging on a set of methods. I'm excited to hear about this new method that is um, sounds like it's going to be a little, little bit cheaper yet still yield some good content or information. Um, so just kind of better documentation of who's who's doing what, where. We've heard, I think, from Delaware that they've been requiring in 1668 and everything for quite a while. And I think there's something going on in Washington State to kind of bring that online for the or at least some of the dischargers. So, you know, differences that run in the country, let's try and get our heads around that. Um, one of the interesting ideas I think is um, on the table is, can we imagine a world where we have multi-parameter thinking? Um, that is, can we do TMDLs that include more than one chemical at a time? I, it's kind of an obvious point that if we take this on one chemical at a time, we're never going to get to the end of the 20,000 chemicals in commerce. So we have, <laughs> we have to be thinking a little more holistically here. And is there synergies? I mean, do you get do you get half of the PFAS TMDL when you do the PCB TMDL, or is it a completely different animal? And does that answer differ from place to place? It probably does, right? But just kind of working that problem and thinking about that, both on the sort of TMDL side, but also on remediation technologies, best management practices, things like that. Uh, is you know, how much are, how much of the PFAS are we taking care of by, by by remediating these PCB sites, or the converse, I guess, would be are we somehow mobilizing PFAS? <laughs> Hopefully not, but you know, uh, you know, as we're as we're taking care of the PCB problem. So just just thinking about those two things in particular, but there's probably a broader discussion around that. Um, Andy, next slide. Please, um, um, non-regulatory incentives. This has always been the problem with Tosca and, and these things. Is that you know a lot of the delays and a lot of the um, well, delays are, are really around this idea of money, you know, money, technical support, and also reduced liability or the ability to do things um, maybe in a, in a little bit more um, innovative space and. But you know, the, if the limitation of that is sort of li liability, then, then that's always been an issue in these kinds of cleanups. So, more discussion around that. Um, more discussion around these relatively I mean, they're not new, but you know, relatively on new on the scene technologies, um, cleaning conveyance systems, um, things of that nature, in situ treatment. We've talked about. Um, is there a good or a catalog of what tools are available in that space and how much have they been documented and characterized. So, you know, is there a is there a, a pull down menu where you can go to and see like here's all the various technologies and as you're evaluating the sort of the residual cleanup at a site um, when you where's all that all set. And my last slide of the day, I think Andy one more. Um, yeah, this is all kind of things that were brought up today um, and I just kind of put it out on the table. Um, I think there's a number of places around the country that are dealing with this issue of PCBs and other stuff that are in the sediments that are trapped behind dams. And that's of interest for a couple of reasons. You know, is is any you know, how much of that stuff is bleeding out on a daily basis or during high flow events and certain times of the year, you know, the, those kinds of things. 
but also as as is in the case of the Conowingo Dam in the Chesapeake and elsewhere, as these dams that were built for flood control and power generation in the 50s and 60s have reached sort of a dynamic steady state with respect to the sediment. You know, they're no longer trapping sediment behind the dams. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff stored behind the dams now. Um, how does that impact dam removal projects? Dam removal is becoming a you know pretty popular thing in parts of the world, parts of the country for fish habitat restoration and things of that nature. So what, what does that all look like? And I know that the Conlingo on the Susquehanna is there's a big effort under, underway right now to understand that, that problem. So that's something that might be of interest in a future discussion. And then the one that is kind of on my mind is sort of sleeping giant here, and I know that people have thought about this pretty hard, is what are we going to do when sea level rise and increased storm frequency in coastal areas begins to inundate some of these beautiful restoration sites that we've built, um, including some of the sites that are still contaminated that maybe have, you know, are stored behind. Um, you know, we, we think they're above sea level, but then, you know, in five years from now, they might be, be below sea level. So what does that look like? Um, and even, it doesn't even have to be a major flooding event, but just as coast, coastal marshes are degraded as this increased salinity affects you know the, the plant growth and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think that that would be something of interest to a number of people that are attending this workshop. So those are, again, I, this is just my random set of thoughts. So there's probably more stuff popping up in the chat. But I just kind of want to kind of get the thinking going about if we were to do more things in the future, what kinds of topics would be on the on, on the on the agenda now that we've kind of introduced introduced these these areas around the, the country to, to to each of us. So Andy, I think I'll stop there and turn it back to you. And by all means, please add more ideas. This is not meant to be exhaustive. So if you have other things, please add them to the chat and RL will write them down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh thanks, Joel. That and, and again reinforcing that idea. So um we're getting a lot of great ideas in the chat and uh did I browse through mural just now and that seemed like a um we're getting some 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 nice stuff to think about there as well. Um, we did, if you recall, we did do a a um, a poll to to get sort of a quick and dirty idea of what the people were, what the people what you all were thinking about um, in in terms of sort of next steps and topics and that sort of thing. And we'll do one follow up here in a minute. But just wanted to share that back out. We didn't have much chance yesterday, um, and I think there were there were on the order of fifty responders. So. Um, we had three questions. We had four questions, but I'll just show three of them now. Um, about topics of interest, um, you can see that there was there was um, a lot of interest in a lot of things, um, which sort of gives promise to, to doing focused um, focus sessions later on. But but source identification uh, uh, kind of popped up as as one of the really interesting topics that that we could potentially uh, hit on in the future. Um, and methods for monitoring, but but again, there were of all these things that we threw out, there was was interest in in most all of them. So everything from effectiveness of of uh, approaches and methods to to pollution removal and cleanup approaches, regulatory tools, and non -re novel regulatory management approaches. So um, um, it looks like there's there's things that that we can be better at and share information on. Uh, on. Um, we were talking about, uh, we also asked about what pathways and sources are, are most challenging to address. Um, and, and stormwater um, uh, sort of highlighted itself here. Um, uh, almost twice as much, twice as many people voted for that one compared to, um, you know, atmospheric deposit and inadvertent production. Um, so, so that looks like an area that's um, uh, pretty ripe for exploration. Um, and, and the other third, you know, the other third, the, the last question was when collaborating with other regions, what are you most interested? Um, and, and there were, um, again, broad sort of um, interest in a lot of them, but, but sort of sharing lessons learned and research findings uh, kind of came out as, as one of the one of the, the, the main areas of mentor, main areas of interest and sort of relatedly over here on the other side, extracting lessons learned from PCV management um, to other emerging compounds. So, so I guess it, it feels like um, sharing these kind of focused lessons learned and, and topics is, is of interest to uh, folks on this call. So that, that was encouraging. I just wanted to share that out. And again, we'll share all this information afterwards. Um, so just now that we're on Zoom, um, Mario, we, we had one more poll, right? So, so just going back to the original, and this is what um, 
Will and I talked about. So we had two primary objectives on these slides. One was to share background and context across geographies. Um, and the other one was, should we do this more in the future? And, and we're just hoping that people would give us a quick bit of feedback on how well we did on, on achieving these objectives. So, um, you know, it's anonymous, so so feel free to to be as as uh, so hopefully as everybody's honest as they they want to be on this, and um, it it just helps us get feedback on on those two questions. Um, and again, we'll use the information that we get from this to plan our next steps. Oops. And I guess uh, Mario, go ahead and. and Keep that open as long as you keep it. It is live and I'll keep it open as folks continue to, to respond. Um, in the meantime, uh, Greg and Will, anything you want to add as reflections while, while folks are sharing their thoughts here? I would say that I am completely humbled by this. Um, yeah, all of our presenters uh, just absolute bosses with regard to PCB champions and warriors and uh, the work is amazing and I think we lose sight sometimes of the difference that we're making and coming together like this one of the benefits is to sort of remind ourselves that we are making a difference and uh, it's because of the work of everybody that's on the meeting today that we're seeing some of those improvements. So uh, I'm just hoping we can be that good in the Chesapeake. And I, I really hope that we do more of this in the future. Will? Yeah, one of the things that kind of stood out to me that was sort of some differences between day one and day two was in today's talks, there was a, a lot of approaches that revolved around uh, a, a TMDL framework. And yesterday we didn't hear much about TMDLs necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. We heard about a looming TMDL in Spokane. Um, and, and, you know, that's something that I've often wondered about as we tackle some of these bioaccumulative chemicals from a regulatory perspective, w what are the useful frameworks in which to do that. And so, um, you know, I guess I just thought it was it's interesting that, um, you know, on the East Coast, there's there's some well, well funded and uh, well put together studies that have fed into these larger TMDLs that perhaps on the West Coast, we've been more hesitant to dive into. The other the other thing that sort of stood out to me is just, you know, and this is probably a known characteristic to many people on this this call is that you know these are multi decadal kind of issues and um, it's it always seems like it's a somewhat of a hodgepodge of approaches and funding as you go along and um, you know that shouldn't necessarily be a deterrent I think for you know getting some of these hot spots removed or moving ahead with you know uh, a smaller remedial strategy um just to sort of get the ball rolling i think on some of these issues thank you both for those reflections um i did transition during that time as to the second poll question which is andy highlighted is really kind of about where where do we take this from here um do we continue some of these conversations and potentially go a little deeper um, on PCBs? Um, you know, part of that is also a question of whether whether conversation shifts to PFOS, which certainly came up in today's conversation as well. Um, so we'll give folks a, a little bit to, to respond there. But while they're doing that, Andy, do you want to bring us home with final thoughts? Yeah, thank you. And um, so, so just just from here, um, again, we heard a lot over the last two days, and it will take some time to to process. I think um, we are going to keep the mural open through next week, and and so I encourage everybody to share feedbacks and, and thought on that. Um, 
the, the presentations will be posted and made available. Um, and we, we as a, a, you know, our organizing team will, will review input on, on Zoom chat and polls and mural to develop an approach for a follow-up plan. Um, and just on those, those, those items, um, after this, I'll share a sort of a, a group-wide email with the links to, um, the, at first, the, the mural poll, just to make sure that, that's, that everybody has that. And then shortly thereafter, once we get the presentations uh, posted, we'll share that link as well. So try not to inundate some uh, too much of the emails, but just a couple follow-up emails in the short term. Um, I think uh, maybe Joel, Greg, or, or Will have uh, asked about this before, but, but if, it, um, if we do carry forward this, we're always, um, um, we're, we're certainly not the, the bastion of good ideas. And if there's there's a lot of good ideas and if anybody's interested in participating, please follow up with us. Um, and, and we're more than welcome to get more, a bigger group for, for um, uh, you know, this kind of coordination and collaboration. So um, um, again, we're, we're, we're a starting group and, and we're experimenting. And so we're, we're hoping to figure out the best way to move forward with this sort of activity. So again, um, uh, that's all I have. I think I appreciate everybody's time. I particularly appreciate the work by the presenters and all the engagement in the um, in the uh, the chat and that sort of thing. So that's that's been uh, fantastic. So I don't know any anything else from from uh, anybody? I guess any of the organizers. I'll just take the last word to thank. So Andy James is really the driver behind a lot of this stuff. So I want to acknowledge that and thank Andy and the rest of the organizing group have worked hard for the last few few months on this. And um, as somebody who's been doing PCBs now for 40 years, as hard as that is to admit, it's great to see so much progress and see these programs that are really got a lot of vitality to them. It's a challenging problem, but we're, we are making progress. I'm excited about moving forward. Hopefully you'll hear from us again. We'll get we'll reconvene in some format in some way and we'll we'll keep this keep the ball rolling. So thanks to all of you for participating. And to Mary Ellen Katrina for running thanks. the back <laughs> office. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, that was fantastic. Happy to. Just don't try to hire either one of them out from underneath of us after you. So <laughs> we will come after you. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, appreciate the great uh, chats continuing. We'll make that available as well in the summary of materials, including all of the, the great resources that have been shared there. Um, so know that if you registered, you will get the, re the materials, as Andy said, and you are welcome to share them. The, the more the merrier. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your afternoons. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all. Thanks to the speakers. Thank you.